folks, and welcome to this week's show. As you can see, we're we're back again with Rod and Jeremy. <laughs> and uh, as you can tell by the, some of the background shots here, we're going to be focusing on the 1980s. And we're going to be focusing on the top 10 albums-ish from the 1980s. Uh, very, very tough choice for me, and I'm sure for Rod and Jeremy as well. And this was inspired a little bit by uh, Rich Shaw's show, or YouTube, so, sorry, Twitter account where he's basically got all the top the top albums, top five. He's got it down to uh, album rankings yeah. show of the eighties. Very very difficult choices, and also sometimes that show's a little dominated by I would, I would describe as indie fan boys. So there's going to be a slight difference, and I'm not denigrating them, so please don't take it that way. But there's going to be a slight difference in terms of uh, some of the choices that we have. I suggest. Um, so I'm I'm not expecting certain albums to be the number one. Let's put it that way. Um, so we're just going to quickly whiz through the criteria or our criteria, and it might all be different in terms of our re reasons and rationale behind our choices. Rod, you just want to tell us what you what you did? Yeah, I struggled with the criteria um, because it's such a well, it's a decade, isn't it? And like you say, it's so vast. And do we include ones we've spoken about before? And I decided that I would if they genuinely deserve to be in there. So. Um, I can't remember how many I've got. There might be two or three, actually. But anyway, um, so I decided to put them in if they deserve to be in. And and then I thought, well, do I do ones that are critically acclaimed, like Graceland and 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 and, and go down? Because there's different ways of looking at it. Whereas I thought, should I just pick my 10 favourite ones? So it's a bit of a mixture of those two things. And then um, I narrowed it down to the ones that I play the most now. So that was my third criteria. So I had a lot of albums that I wrote down. And then I thought, Say like a couple of Smiths albums. I say which one would I which one I put on now? I, I, I pick that one sort of thing. So it's the ones I listen to now. So the ones that stood the test of time. So I suppose that's how I did them. Good, good. They're very straight that Rod spot on. Yeah. Jeremy, how about yourself? Well, I have a playlist thanks to Rich Shaw's Twitter thing that he's been doing for the last four years. <laughs> I have a playlist of close to five hundred songs from 80s albums yeah so that's 500 albums that and they're not all five star albums obviously i had to select some of those out but it's still just kind of like a, a throwing spaghetti at the wall situation one way i dealt with it was deciding to leave out anything that i included in the post-punk show yeah. even though to say the two or three post-punk albums that i had on that show that are from 1980 or beyond are not among the best of the 80s would be ridiculous they absolutely are and similar to rod i just pick things that i really love listening to even now and have been enjoying maybe even more now than i did five years ago for whatever reason it's all about you know where you are where you're at what's making you happy what's moving you and some of them are just incredibly important albums to me that i cannot seem to shake no matter what and one or two of them might have been ones that I regretted not including in the post-punk show because I had my own twisted criteria for that. Mm. So I managed to narrow it down. It's a list on a day, and it could be different tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the phrase I think we'd all use, isn't it? A list on a day. I mean, I was going through them, and I chopped them down to about 15, and I was like scratching my head, sending the list to me two mates. What do you reckon of this? What do you think of this? So my, my mine's basically somewhere in the middle between the pair of you. I've not included any of the post-punk albums that I did. So The Dreaming, for example, is not going to be on there by me, uh, for, by Kate Bush, um, and Ultravox I'm going to be on, although they would both probably make my lists. And, and again, I went down the route of which albums do I play the most? Uh, and in some cases, like Rod... It's critically acclaimed, and I appreciate its work of genius. So I thought, well, yeah, and this artist has to be in there because it it sums up the nineteen eighties. There's a couple of areas I think that I've missed out, and I'm gonna we'll talk about it later. That I think should have been in, and it's, it feels wrong for me to, not to have them in. Or I suspect all of us at some point, but we shall see as we go along go along the lists there, and I'll I'll bring those in as well because I, I feel. The eighties was such a, va a varied decade. Um, I think personally, I'm, I would just edge the seventies over it in terms of albums, but I'd, I'd, I'd edge the eighties in terms of singles. So it's uh, little swings and roundabouts, if you like. So a great decade, really varied. Obviously, I, I, for myself, I, it was my teenage years. 
So, you know, it was obviously a, a huge, big deal. So uh, there we have it. So we're going to start with with yourself, Rod, and we're going to go go through the list there. And what's your number okay. 10? Um, <clears throat> well, I'm actually starting off with um, the first um, doubler, really. Um, so it was in my post-punk list. And no, it wasn't in my post-punk list, but it was in my talking heads list. Um, so it's another list we did. But um, but it was, it was my number one talking heads album, was Speaking in Tongues, just ahead of Remain in Light. It could have been either, really. Yeah. I appreciate Remaining Lights probably is certainly more seminal um, and more um, probably more critically acclaimed and more influential because it was earlier. But I just think of all their albums, again, if I play if I play Talking Heads now, I'd play that album first just because it's the perfect blend between Fear of Music and Remaining Light and their more accessible end. Um, but it mixes both kind of perfectly, really. Um, it's got one of the best openers and closers, I could imagine, with Burning Down the House and This Must Be the Place, Naive Melody, which is possibly possibly my favourite talking heads track, certainly one of them. Um, so the, it's got a banging opener and closer. It's got Girlfriend is Better. Yeah. It's Slippery People. It's it's, um, it's punctuated by the Strange Swamp, which I really like as well. It's a completely different track. Kind of almost doesn't fit on the album, really, but it's still very much talking heads. And I just think the variety and um, I think it, uh, of all our albums, I think it, it kind of covers everything they are on one album, the best for me, and which is why I play it probably the most. I still play Fear of Music, I still play Remaining Light, but um, it, yeah, pushed to, that's my favourite album of theirs, and I could not have um, a best album in the 80s without top 10 without a Talking Heads album in it, because they're one of my favourite bands. And they spanned the eighties, obviously started in the seventies, but spanned the eight well into the eighties. Um, and they're just unique, fantastic band. And like I say, I had to make a space for a Talking Heads album. So yeah, that one's coming at ten. I'm pleased you picked it because I played them this morning, and it was that album. And that <laughs> is, I, I agree with everything you said. It's probably the album I played the most. And if I was to redo the show, because I, I think I sort of had them tied first and I flipped it, <laughs> and I, I would probably go with it. I, I totally. Yeah. Totally concur with everything you've said. So great choice in at number 10. Jeremy, what have you got in at number 10? Yeah, that's a great, great album. Absolutely. So my number 10 is the one of three second albums in my list, and also one of three albums that have been compared to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Maybe it took from 68 to 78 for people to actually start thinking we could try this in a different way. You know, a decade in, we're going to make our own Sgt. Pepper. And the album I'm talking about is Paul's Boutique by the Beastie Boys. Uh. <laughs> Came out in 1989. And no, I'm not picking it just because I shot the cover photograph. <laughs> I was going to mention it. <laughs> Probably talked about before. But yes, I did shoot the cover photograph. And I've told the story before about how when License Deal came out, I was pretty annoyed by it. I really felt that they would kind of sold out to this sort of frat boy thing. And there's a few good songs on it. I never bought it, did not like it, never saw any of those concerts when they were performing it, like when they opened for Madonna or any of that stuff. And then they came back to where we had been in a sense, which was all the music we loved from the 60s and 70s. They just chopped it up with the help of the Dust Brothers, and they put it in there, and then they told these hilarious stories over the top of it. What could go wrong? It's just absolutely fabulous. And I, one of my favorite moments of my whole relationship with them was after we shot the photo, we were in the car because we had a second location we were going to try, and they put on the unmixed, unmastered Paul's Boutique, and I, my mind was blown instantly. I was like, this is it. You guys have done it. This is the album I wanted from you all along. And then, of course, it's famously flopped at first. I think only about 10,000 people bought it. And it took it took something like a decade to go gold. Hilarious story, I think. But just the absolute brilliance of the way they mashed up all those things. Pink Floyd and Sly Stone and the Beatles. Yeah. Dylan, I mean, it's just so much fun. It's colorful, it's cartoonish, 
but I think musically it's completely solid. Another funny story about it is I went over to Mike's apartment back then and he handed me the discs that DJ Hurricane used on tour, which was Paul's Boutique Instrumentals, the two, it was two LPs. He hands it to me and he goes, it, it might actually be even better without our voices on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, I, I think if you had to pick 10 albums that are the most influential albums of the 1980s, that's without a doubt, Paul's Boutique is wrong. Absolutely. Right? And of course, Absolutely it's... Absolutely up there, isn't it? It was, a, it was a sampler's paradise yeah. before the lawyers came in. Yeah, you'd never get away with it now. I think it was them you and never Dilla make Soul. this album today. It was them and Dilla Soul, wasn't of it? Samples the same, yeah, it. who basically <laughs> released those two albums. And, uh, and That's not to say I don't think people like Sly Stone and George Clinton didn't get paid for people using their music. But I mean, there was something, there was a unique, you know, Wild West creativity about that time. I mean, James Brown, it sort of reinvented him, didn't it? You know, the whole sampling yeah. thing, you know. So, yeah, that's... That's fair dues, I think. Oh, it's a great album. It kind of closes out the decade, leads to a lot of things coming yeah. in the 90s. Yeah, absolutely. So great, a, great album. Chance. On my shortlist, absolutely fantastic. I, I wondered whether you pick it, I wasn't sure. Um, I just did a review on a football show, funnily enough, and mentioned it as well. Mentioned you. Uh, my number 10 is carrying on the Sgt. Pepper's theme, funnily enough. Um, I was going to go with another album, which is probably my favourite album by The Barn, but I've gone with a different one because it's probably the one I play the most, which fits in with Rod's criteria. And I've gone with Oranges and Lemons by XTC, which I just think is a great album. And it, it does have that Sgt. Pepper's sort of... You're right, that's totally another one. Feel to it, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, it's definitely got that sort of feel. It's a great, great album. It's very just great, catchy songs. It's probably a double album because it's about 67 minutes and it's one of those rare yeah. albums that fills the CD and everything on it is brilliant and it's not just like nine good songs and five bits of filler every song is an absolute banger um, yeah. some great singles like pop songs like The Mayor of Simbleton is just fa fabulous you know and I, I love some of the real unusual songs on here I'm just looking at my list I mean obviously The Lovin's a great song but there's some really unusual things like Merely a Man which is very odd uh, across the Ant Heap, uh, which was written for Skylark, but again, it's lovely. This um, poor skeleton steps out again is just bonkers, but brilliant. And then you've got the, the really rude uh, uh, song, uh, Pink Thing, which is fantastic, <laughs> fantastic, but so catchy <laughs> all at the same time. I mean, you can figure out what it's about. Um, and it's just brilliant. And then Chalk Hills and Children is one of the greatest songs mm. I think they ever Absolutely wrote. Gorgeous. It's a fabulous song. It's a great, great album. The production's really excellent. I mean, the production's weird because it's really busy. There's lots going on. It was that classic 80s thing where let's fill all the space. Yet, bizarrely, there's also space on it. It's a real yeah. odd production, yet superb. So, yeah, my number, my, my number, my number 10 there, Oranges and Lemons. It's an absolute... Funny. I have a funny story about that album. I went to the store to buy it and they were selling it in a little double, the little mini CDs. Yes. And it was so cute. I had to buy it. I got it home and it would not play. Would not play on anything I had to play. In the doctor. So I brought it back and got my money back and bought the regular CD. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's little, the <laughs> it was so cute. Around them, they're just weird. Uh, yeah, it's great, 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 great album. So Rod, what have you got at number nine? Uh, number nine, I've got um, The Queen is Dead by The Smith, which could have been a bit higher. Um, but going, again, going back to my criteria a little bit, I suppose, um, it dropped down a little bit because I don't play it as much as I used to. I don't play The Smith as much as I used to, I guess. Um, I appreciate, again, in terms of influence, so many bands sounded like them after them um, and were influenced by them. Um, their debut album is close to being as good, I think. Um, and my favourite song by them is on Meet His Murder. Mm -hmm. My favourite song is the head Headmaster Ritual, I'd say, probably. Um, but Queen Is Dead is probably the most complete album, I think, of theirs. Um, I just, yeah, I mean, There Is A Light That Never Goes Out and Cemetery Gates, I like. I really like I Know It's Over. Mm. Of, their, of their slow tempo, it's a great song. There's a really good cover by Jeff Buckley, isn't it? I think. Have you heard that? Yeah, I know it's over by Jeff Buckley. Yeah, really sort of angst, angst-ridden one. I mean, um, 
and it's a bit of an obvious one because it would be in a lot of top 10 lists, I suppose. But rightly, I think. Um, so it's kind of peak Smiths, isn't it? I don't know if you guys agree. Um, well, some, I agree. I, th I think it's that or Strange Ways for me. Yeah, yeah Strange Ways as well, where it got a bit more orchestral. It brought strings in more, a bit more, it was a bit a bit more sort of polished almost, I think, they became. We did a I Strange Ways when I had I that as my number one. Strange What's that? Ways. Strange ways you can feel them pulling apart, though, I feel. Yeah. If the Queen is dead, everything is firing on all cylinders. Every song. Yeah. I think that's what I, I think. I'd agree with that, I think. And that's probably why I, Strange Ways Here We Come has got some, yeah, I think some weaker tracks on it, I think, a little yeah. bit. Um, although last night I dreamt, one of my mm -hmm. favorite Smith songs yeah. again of all time, last night I dreamt. It's got that build up. I think it goes on for about a minute. It goes on for ages, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you think when's he going to come in? But it's <laughs> but it still works. Anyway, I'm on a talk. I'm talking about a different album now, aren't I? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but again, I, I suppose the Smiths had to be on there. Um, yeah. I and the other thing I did, I, I found myself on my list. I had a couple of albums by bands and artists, you know, multiple records, and I've deliberately um, tried to just put one in. Yeah, I've done that. Picked one. I could have picked mm -hmm. four XTC oh, albums. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Except in one instance, but I've, I've nearly done that. But I, I've only put one Smiths album in, and um, yes, the Queen is dead because a bit like Jeremy just said, it's it's probably them firing on all cylinders, um, and it's not quite as high because I don't play it as much. Yeah, and that's. I think it's probably just a um, a style thing. It's a little bit, and also Morrissey being a bit of a. Yeah, uh, I, I well, think that's yeah. the reason why I don't play a tad, them. A tad unlikable, shall I, I say think that? That's the reason why I don't play them as much, Rod. And they were on my list till this till this afternoon, funny enough, mm. and it was that album. Mm. And yeah. I just yeah, it's 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 weird, isn't it? Because I loved them. I saw them on the Queen is Dead tour. Uh, I was right at the front at the Mayfair in Newcastle. It was one of the greatest gigs I've ever been to. Yeah, they were very good um, live. And um yeah, that's that was the reason they've not made my list, if I'm being honest. Which, Which is a shame. Is Johnny but... Moore, isn't it? Because he's a great bloke. And it's and it's, it's an age-old argument, isn't it? You know, can you separate the artist from the material? You know, whether it's Michael Jackson, whether it's John, John Martin, who, who who was who I love, John Martin, but he he used to hit, get drunk and, and hit his, you know, he, he, he's he was Not aggressive. You, I, I agree with you, and I generally can, but but I, I have a real issue at the minute, and I think that's probably it. You know, but he's still here being unpleasant. Yeah, right. <laughs> regularly, which doesn't help. I don't think. No. Whereas so, Michael Jackson and John Martin aren't here anymore, so yeah. it's a bit the fact that he's still here saying <laughs> silly you, Buck. and just being I'll a bit be, naughty. the Renaissance, of course, as well. But, well, exactly. Uh, well, yeah, that as well. But he, he's still being nauseating on a regular basis, so <laughs> I'm not sure that helps much. But what I also say about Morrissey is that his recent albums have been a huge disappointment for years, yeah. years. Yeah, he yeah. wasn't being a dope. Yeah, you know, just because there are some oh. artists who are deeply unlikable. Van Morrison immediately seems to spring to mind. Yeah, yeah, I love his music. You know? he, yeah, but again, yeah, I would agree with Jeremy. His, his music so petered out a lot. I think Boxfall and I was probably the last great album he made. And that was yeah, he's, he's done Your Arsenal. Some of the early ones are decent. Your Arsenal's a great album. Oh, not for a while, love that. but not for a, quite a while. Though. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think right. I think not notwithstanding all of that stuff, I, you know, I had to put one of their albums in, so I went for. The obvious one, I suppose. Yeah, it is a belt. It's an absolute banger. It really is. Yeah, it's a top, top draw album. And yeah, great, great band, let's be honest. Yeah, absolutely. Jeremy, what have you got at number nine? Number nine, I have Cupid and Psyche 85 by Scritti Politti, which we could call pop music's post-punk revenge or post-punk's pop music revenge, something like that. Because when you think about the fact that the first Scritti Politti song I heard was on the Wanna Buy a Bridge, compilation hit they had a song in there called skank block bologna which is this sort of odd loping collage marxist thing and then i missed the sec i missed the first album songs to remember at the time and next thing you know i'm hearing things like perfect way and it kind of blew my mind and i wasn't actually sure i liked it but i had a really good friend in college and he handed me the cassette in the dark room one day. he was like listen to this so I put it on and I'm listening to it and I'm I'm kind of drawn to it, but I'm also kind of like, there's no like real bass to it. It's very kind of busy and there's all this stuff going on. And I remember giving him back the tape and just saying to him, but there's no bass on it. He just goes, I know. Like, 
like you're you're using the wrong criteria to judge this music. So it took me a little while, but I did eventually get back to get into it. And I've been playing it recently, thanks to the Twitter contests. And it's just <laughs> so much fun. It's brilliantly assembled. And when you think about the technology they had at the time was not what we have today. I mean, they were using sampling and they were using digital stuff, but a lot of it was still painstaking work, but it still soars. And he is so smart, Green, Green Guard side. The lyrics are incredible. You know, I've got a new hermeneutic, you know, just playing with the idea that pop music can have these kind of words in it. And also doing things like including Robert Quine on a song just plays a killer guitar solo, you know, and it's just so good and so thorny in the midst of this polished perfection. But I just think it's partly the idea that this, this guy who came out of nowhere is suddenly competing with Michael Jackson on the charts, competing with someone who has been groomed all their life to be a star. I mean, the song Perfect Way hit number 11 in, in America. I mean, that's not easy to do. That's impressive. Mm -hmm. It's just, and it, I just think it's, I, I, I revel in all the little sounds. Every, every sound seems to trigger another sound and then it bounces back to the original sound. It's so much fun. And, and his voice, he really worked on his voice. It's this, you know, very high pitched kind of falsetto throughout it. Just absolutely love it. And, you know, I'm not alone, right? Miles Davis covered Perfect Way. Yes, he did. <laughs> and Miles Davis appeared on the next album. So there were some heavy people who were loving Scritti Politti. The fact that he also worked with Arif Martin, who had produced Aretha Franklin, and he has a song, Pray Like Aretha Franklin. You know, it's just like all those little connections. Actually, Arif Martin's son went to my high school, a little bit older than me, totally Joe Martin, totally cool guy, really, really great guy. But... I just think it's a brilliant, brilliant album. It's, I think it's also still influential today when you listen to dance pop and those kind of things where it's like heavily produced vocal harmonies and, and you know, poppy melodies. Scritti Play is still in the DNA of our music today. So that's one reason I picked it. But I just absolutely love it. So Cupid and Psyche 85. Excellent. It's not something I'm familiar with, so I'm going to have to check it out. Um, so much fun. My number nine, I've gone down the classic rock route, more the sort of metal-y type route. Um, mm -hmm. Metal was enormous in the 80s, and um, I, I feel guilty because I haven't really got any of what I would describe as any of the real hard, hard metal albums in, mm -hmm. by the likes of Maiden or, or the big four, Metallica, Anthrax, Slayer, uh, Megadeth, none of them, even though Metallica came quite close. But I've, for number nine, I've gone for one of the biggest selling albums of all time. And it's the biggest selling album of all time, one of them, because it's brilliant. That's Back in Black by ACDC. <laughs> um, it, it's just great. The production is possibly the best produced album I think I've ever heard. The production <laughs> is is unbelievable by Mutt Lang. It's superb. It sounds incredible. Um, it's Obviously, it's the album where uh, Brian Johnson, from just over the road from me, sort of uh, took over vocals after the tragic death of Bon Scott. And uh, it's got the classic black sleeve, you know, as a form of tribute, back in black. Obviously, the title tells you everything you need to know. Kicks off with Hell's Bells as well, which is one of the best intros to any album I've ever mm -hmm. heard. And again, that sense of mourning, and then they just come kicking in, really hard rock. I'm not going to go through all the tracks because we all know them. It's part of people's <laughs> DNA, isn't it? But it's it's a great, great album, and it's a... It's a... It's, it's sort of a victory a victory album in some respects, bearing in mind the tragic loss that they had because everybody thought that they'd be just finished as a band. It's very yeah. rare you get a, a replacement yeah. from outside the band to come in and take over and do such an incredible job. And they absolutely nailed it with an, an incredible rock album with you know some real, real bangers on it. I mean, Back in Black is one of the most sampled songs around at the moment. My kids love it. Uh, <laughs> you Shut Me All Night Long is a great song, of course. So incredible. Rock and roll ain't noise pollution. Great, great hit. Um, there's some really funny lyrics on the album as well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's, it's, you talk about the great lyrics of Splitty Politi, these are quite different, aren't they? You know, in terms of the classic double entendre, you know, um, <laughs> giving the dog a bone. I mean, you don't have to work up too much about it. Let me put my love into you. 
<laughs> with the classic line, let me cut your cake with my knife. I mean, it's you just choke <laughs> on your drink when you're listening to it, but it's brilliant. I mean, it's the blues, if you think about it. It's tongue in cheek. Blues songs have all that kind of stuff. It's tongue in cheek, and it's really got a sparkle about it. So you laugh, yeah. and it's, you know, it's fun, and it's brilliant. It's great rock. Brian Johnson's voice is like brilliant on it. I don't think he ever sounded better than on this album. Mm-hmm. And the band were in you know, full, full motion. So, yeah, Back in Black, it's an absolute classic hard rock guitar album. Everybody should own a copy of it, in my opinion. It's just brilliant. So Absolutely. And, you know, I have to say that at the time it came out, 1980, yeah. I was deep into punk, post-punk, and making my own music. So the idea of even liking an ACDC song was sort of not done among my circle. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, I bought that You Shook Me All Night Long single. I bought the 45 because I was like, this is a great song. Maybe yeah. I don't need the album, but this song is absolutely fabulous. Well, and, you know, just the the structure of it and when they hit those power chords, just mind-blowing. When you talk about space, too, when you think about a song like Back in Black, that space in the intro, yeah, yeah, you was know, satisfying, you know. Another funny thing I have to say about that is doing karaoke I tried singing Back in Black, <laughs> and it is really hard. The guy has yeah. lung power. It's yeah. easier to sing Led Zeppelin songs. Yeah. Way easier, because Robert Plant has a different style of breathing. Yeah. But that guy, Brian Johnson, yeah. man. It's, it's all he out. Must, he must be a, a runner or something, because his lung control is... All out crazy. nuclear attack with his voice. But in the UK, whether you talk about the post punk, just to sidetrack for a second there, is there were three of the harder rock bands were sort of accepted by the punks you had motorhead acdc and then slightly later iron maiden those were probably yeah, three yeah. that sort of had a bit of a, a bit of a crossover and weren't really sort of they didn't have any grief sure. in it. so it no. well so yeah wasn't brian johnson i know he is a geordie but wasn't he in a yeah. band called geordie he was in geordie yeah they had a few hits as well in the uk yeah, so yeah, yeah. Singles, <laughs> singles in the charts i think minor chart success i think yeah if you get the chance another... folks listen to his audio I... book it's fantastic hmm. Imagine how daunting it would have been for him initially, oh. you know, doing gigs and, and performing, you know, immediately. Yeah. You know, the, the early the early gigs straight yeah. after. Absolutely. Bob, Bob. Absolutely. He mentions it in his book. Brilliant. Yeah, I can imagine Brilliant. it must have been so daunting for him. Great like, fella. I'm, I'm, are they going to accept me? You know, will I be good yeah. enough? You know, such an iconic, a, revered, iconic revered singer. Bon, Bob, I, mean, I mean, Bon Scott's got his own festival. Yeah. Hasn't he? Yeah, he does actually. In Scotland. Yeah. The town he comes from, they've got a yeah. Bon Scott festival mm-hmm. every year. Even now, brilliant. You know, so, yeah, he's managed to, you know, do his own thing and be as, if not more, successful. Yeah, to step into those enormous shoes and he's filled them. So you know, well, I'm done not sure it's him. been done before to that effect. No, no. So by anybody? No. Nah. So, I don't think so. Well done to him. So Rod, what's your number eight? Yeah, um, number eight. I've got um, the head on the door by the Cure. Um, that. I've probably mentioned it before. They, were, they are one of my favourite bands. Um, probably my third favourite band, maybe. Third or fourth favourite band, probably. Um, and th- this is the first... I, I bought their debut album. I got, this, is, this is their first really big-time accessible album. But Because they did Pornography and Faith, didn't they? Which yeah, great albums. Them. Great albums in their own right, but, but not accessible. And, and to be able to sort of pivot and do that album as as well as they did do it like in between days is as good an opening track as you, you know that that bass and acoustic guitar the riff the intro to in between days I, I i play it now talking about things i play i mean i play that album um it's just a fantastic opening track push i love it's got your know, half of it's an intro again but it's just classic you know um robert smith you know guitar like just like heaven style just unique riffing, really. Um, and then the keyboards, the way that they bring it all together. Close to me is a unique little, almost funky track, really. Um, with sort of claustrophobic feel, but just, it's funky, basically. And then, you, but, they're, but they're still sort of dark, so they're kind of melancholic, but accessible and joyous, but all at the same time. Um, and unique. I mean, it might be accessible, but... I, Robert Smith, I think, is a, a genius, a bit like Andy Partridge is a genius. And, and yeah. you know, you get people come along, you know, his soundscapes and the way he puts, you know, songs together and 
is is incredible. And and, and although the reason I like the Cure so much is they're a bit like Radiohead. It's probably why I like Radiohead a lot. Is they're they're very melancholy, obviously, but joyously <laughs> melancholy. <laughs> so it's it, you know it's hard to be um, write something you know that's clearly melancholic, that's joyous and uplifting simultaneously. Not many artists do that, but the Cure and Radiohead do that as good as anybody. Um, and that's why I love the Cure so much. And the Head on the Door is one of the one of their albums that I play the most to this day. Um, and we'll always they've got a new album coming out which I'm I have, I can't wait because I saw them on the last tour and all the new songs sounded great and the first couple of tracks they've released a couple haven't they already yeah it's very it's yeah classic cure really yeah. alone is fantastic anyway yeah. we'll get into it but yeah yeah um, love it. great great choice absolutely great choice Rod love it um, yeah great great choice uh, Jeremy what have you got at number 8 Number eight, I have the second album by Public Enemy. It takes a nation of millions to hold us back. Public Enemy was a band I read about in the New York Times, as we did back then. And they sounded so intriguing that I immediately ran out and bought their first album, Yo Bum Rush the Show, without hearing a note of it. Just the way it was described, I said, this has got to be something that I hear. Now, that album was really, really good. Fantastic use of samples, great the Chuck D's voice was so powerful already, but the album itself is a little bit flawed in the in the sense that side two drags a bit. So it's not their best album, but it's one of the best debut albums, I think. But then just a year later, they come out with this, which is an absolute end-to-end -end masterpiece. When you think about the songs on here, the second song is Bring the Noise. I mean, that's one of the greatest hip hop songs of all time. And then by the time Black Steel and the Hour of Chaos came on, which is like two thirds of the way through the album, that's the one that uses the Isaac Hayes sample, you know, the piano riff from uh, Hot Buttered Soul, hyperbolic, syllabic, sesquidelemental, you know, that song. <laughs> that's like one of my soundtracks still today. If I'm not listening to music and I'm walking down the street, that song is probably one of the ones that's going to circulate in my head. Just such a great groove. And the whole story he tells about getting locked up because he wouldn't sign up for the draft and then calling on the you know, the Black Steel to come break him out. Uh, it's just the storytelling, the beats, the rhymes. The other thing they did was they had gone on a huge tour after the first album. So they started incorporating some of those tour sounds into the the live stuff into the album it's just great i think they did that even more on the next album fear of a black planet but it, it's definitely one of the greatest albums of all time and maybe the best hip-hop album of all time it's absolutely astonishing everything about it is just perfect in my estimation i, I it still gives me a thrill gets me out of my chair if i put it on today so and you can see we're Deep in the CD era by 1988. Mm -hmm. That's when I got my first CD player. So I was able to get some of this stuff on CD. <laughs> You're right. It's a great choice. I mean, again, they're almost like the punk rock band of uh, hip hop, weren't they, for the time? So great, great choice. Great yeah, album. So heavy, the production. Top, top album. Uh, my number eight is uh, Dexie's Midnight Runners. And I've gone with two Raya. I think it's absolutely fantastic. I could have chosen three Dick. Three Dexys albums, and I've gone with this one. Um, I could have chosen any of those three, the, any of the first three, because they're brilliant. Um, it's the, the new mix is great, and I love it, by the way. The, it's the 2022 mix. It's nice and warm, sounds much better. Just a great, great album. It's got a real Celtic feel instead of less horns than on the first album, Searching, Searching for the Young Soul Rebels, which is also outstanding. Um, it's just some, got some great, great songs on it. Kevin Rowland's voice is so unique it's brilliant it's very 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 moody it's, it's really sort of the whole album's got loads of textures to it some just banging tunes of course celtic soul brothers is brilliant let's make this precious is fabulous Jack, their cover of jackie wilson said is is the definitive version for me it's brilliant remember singing it at the match we used to sing it at the football uh <laughs> old one of my favorite ever songs again roland's voice is just superb um it's, you know, it's challenging the views of others. Um, 
but it's just beautiful, beautiful the way he sings it. Plan B, brilliant, different version to the to the original Soul version, and a lot of references to various Soul singers on it, like Bill Withers and stuff. Uh, I'll show you is fantastic. Lies A to E until I believe me, Soul is absolutely fantastic. So the album has a, a real few different mixes on it as well, because there's a little jazz little section in it as well. And then, right, of course, at the end, you've got Come On, Eileen, which is played at every wedding party and so on and so forth. But it's a great song, you know. Great songs are great songs. Uh, I must have danced to it a million times. But it's just a great, it's a superb album. Could have been higher on my list. I have to be honest, number 10 to ten to 3, I could literally just throw them all up in the air and go, well, that's I, <laughs> one and two were nailed on. Um, it is just fantastic album. Go and listen to it, folks. Dexy's any of the first three albums. This is possibly the most accessible of the of the of the three albums. This are the first. Um, just a great, great underappreciated band, in my opinion. Should have been absolutely enormous. So there we go. My number eight, Dexy's Midnight Runners, two right here. Brilliant album. Rod, what have we got? Number seven. Um, number seven, I've got the um, fantastic Kate Bush with um, hands. <clears throat> excuse me, Hands of Love at seven. Um, again, it's probably our most well-known album, but for a reason. Um, opens with Running Up That Hill, which, you know, I know it's, it's it might be overplayed these days with Stranger Things and all the rest of it, but it's just a fantastic song. You know, it's, it's timeless. It, it's, it's of no era. It could, it could be released next week. It still sounds fresh, I think, as, as most of this album. It's so unique because you've got, you had the 80s, was, you had a lot of, synth pop you had you know post-punk you had metal um genres a go-go really in the yeah. 80s um and then kate bush yeah, really. yeah that's right literally just hovering around in, in in a in a separate um on a different plane to anyone else really because she's just she's not like anybody else um she's unique you know cloud busting absolutely love that song it's kind of based on on a sort of scientific um, I can't remember the chap's name now, but obviously there was a guy who, who was yeah. researching. That's a beautiful song. Stuff, so that it's all done in that fantastic video of Donald Sutherland and everything. Mm -hmm. That tells the story of it, doesn't it? But she's very cerebral anyway. You know, incredibly cerebral, isn't she? Into, you know, and and um, and then you've got sort of cloud busting, and you've also got the title track and Big Sky and all this up tempo stuff. And the second half is completely different. Isn't it? It's like a suite of you know. Beautiful but beautiful in its own right, but completely different to the first half. So it's like, but they're both fantastic and it works somehow. Um, but she's a sort of artist that she just does stuff that you, you think it might, it shouldn't work, but it kind of does. Um, her voice is otherworldly. Um, I like otherworldly singers um, that just sort of take you somewhere and, and don't sound like anybody else. I like quite a lot of artists that don't sound like anybody else, whether it be Talking Heads or Joy Division or who, but but Kate Bush is in a bracket um, and in a and in a class of her own in in lots of respects. Um, and again, of all her albums, much as I, I like the Dreaming, I like the I like Sensual World, I like a lot of her stuff. But I'd probably if I was going to put an album on, I'd probably still put that album, on, even though again it's a a, a main although a, big, a biggest selling album I think probably, but. Um, it's just a fantastic album, and it sounds, you know, timeless. Mm. Uh, top tier. It's just top tier stuff. I think. Yeah, absolutely agree. Top top notch. Go and check our Kate Bush show out, folks. It's uh, yeah, there are some interesting choices on it. It's great. Love it. Uh, great choice, though. Dare I say, she is a genius. I have no doubt about it. Yeah. Super choice. Super choice. What have you got at number seven, Jeremy? I have Grace Jones. Night Club in. Yeah, wow, great choice. This, in a way, is a second album because she put out three albums of disco. Yeah. La Vie and Rose was fantastic, but the rest of it felt very disengaged. And they were not, I don't think, artistically successful, I think. And they weren't even financially that successful. But when she started working with Chris Blackwell and the Compass Point All Stars, who he assembled just for her. That was Sly and Robbie and yep. Barry Reynolds, just these amazing musicians. He put them all together in the studio. The story goes, before they made Warm Leatherette, he sent them photos of her that he had blown up to poster size because she was working on this image with her, her boyfriend at the time, Jean-Paul Goud. And they put these posters up around the studio 
and they started kind of vibing to them and jamming to them. So then when she arrived, they were ready for her. Warm Leatherette is an amazing album. I just happen to like this one just a hair better. It's a real toss of a numbers. coin between the pair of them. Both brilliant. Yeah, it's every song on this, except for maybe one, to me is just top notch. Walking in the Rain, what a great, these are all, most of them are covers, but her interpretations are so unique. And the way the band like reworks the rhythms of everything, so great. And her version of Bill Withers' Use Me is another one of those songs that I have on a loop playing on my head all the time. Just the rhythm is so good. You know, it's just a great song to walk around to. Obviously, at the time, the one that I fixated on was Pull Up to the Bumper. I bought the 12 inch, put that on every party mix. The groove on that, it's just such a great dance song. It's unbelievable. And when you think about it, it's not really reggae, it's not really pop, it's not really new wave, but it's all those things at once art rock reggae it's pop yeah so great and taking on songs like nightclubbing that's already a great song uh, yeah so the only one that i found a little disappointing is the song art groupie which she wrote with barry reynolds i don't think she was quite up to snuff for herself you know writing her own stuff yet but she did get she did get there on her last album hurricane real all written by her and it's just fantastic great album. I think that was 2011. Saw on that tour. It was an incredible tour. Right? I saw her too. It was just, yeah, she's one of the greatest live Very funny as well. I see her in the 80s. I think I was the only like, straight man in the whole audience. Uh, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just absolutely love nightclubbing. Of course, the photograph. Oh, magnificent. Just amazing. And she really, you know, Chris Blackwell would send her a bunch of songs and she would definitely... He would set them up. She would knock them down. She didn't think it was right. They wouldn't do it. If they tried a song and it wasn't coming together, they would just move on. So there's this kind of spontaneity yeah. amidst the absolute sonic studio perfection of every note on this. So, yeah, it's just an absolutely great record. The next one's pretty good, too. And then she gets a little wayward until Hurricane came out. But, yeah, I absolutely love Grace Jones. Her memoir is a hoot. She wrote a great book called I'll Not I'll Never Write My Memoirs that really just goes I'll never check that out. So I'll check that out. Yeah, no, it's a really good read. It's not that long, but she goes in depth on how she and Chris Blackwell work together. Just great stuff. Brilliant. It's, you know, iconic 80s image, if nothing else. But great choice. Well, my number seven is for me the man who defined the 80s, and that's Prince, and I've gone with Purple Rain. It's just a work of brilliance. Um, is it my favourite Prince album? I don't think actually it is. Uh, Parade probably nicks that that title. But I've gone with Purple Rain because it's the one I play the most. And I think it's also the album, the album that defines the 80s in terms of him. Uh, he was just an absolute genius. He really was. It's uh, it sold 25 million copies or something ridiculous. Uh, and quite rightly so, it's brilliant. Can I just say, the film's absolutely atrocious, by the way. We watched it recently. My, <laughs> my kids were like, mouths open, it was how bad it was. But the, the actual, the, the songs are just top draw. Um, he wrote most of the songs on it, a couple that he couple of co-wrote, but I mean, Let's Go Crazy is one of the greatest intros to any album. And it's, it's five, it's, I believe it was a number one in America, which it wasn't released in the UK. Um, I mean, some great pop songs. Take Me With You superb with Apollonia on the back end. Um, which other ones jump out? They're all jump out, really. Beautiful ones, great. Computer Blue, co-written with his dad in that as well. And uh, Dr. Fink and Wendy Lisa. When When Doves Cry is one of the great pop songs of the 1980s. Absolutely love it. Didn't have any bass on it. It was the last song he wrote for the album, apparently, as well. And it's just marvellous. I Three think he got that idea from Scurdy Politi. No, is kidding. that right? <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. Uh, Doll and Nicky is the one that caused all the controversy, of course, and then uh, put stickers on the front of the album, seeing that it was there, uh, had uh, rude lyrics on it. And then we've got like a few few songs were recorded live. The last three tracks were all recorded live and then sort of dubbed. So mm -hmm. I think I had uh, I Would Die For You, Baby I'm A Star, and then obviously Purple Rain, which, which is magnificent as well. It's an absolute epic. Mm -hmm. 
transcends music in some respects. And I, I, I think he was that sort of artist. He was that artist of the 80s for me. He's sort of the ultimate artist of the 1980s. And he was never as great again by the end of it. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think he ever recorded another truly great album. He, re he recorded some very good albums, but I don't think he ever recorded a truly great album after that period as well. He was hot for 10 years or so. Um, <laughs> but what a, what a writer. I mean, what a back catalogue. Let's be honest, brilliant back catalogue. So, yeah, Prince for me, um, Purple Rain, just brilliant. I'm, I'm notoriously a Prince skeptic, but I will say that I did dance a lot to When Doves Cry. Yeah. <laughs> When that came out, strangely, yeah. strangely, I'm I'm a Prince skeptic as well. Really? Wow, I find it hard <laughs> to understand. You know, you get artists that, you, that come along and they're massive, and I appreciate them. <clears throat> you know, like you uh, mentioned earlier, briefly about appreciating their expertise and musicianship, all those sorts of things. But yeah, pr um, Prince, I don't own a record by him. I wouldn't want to. You know, it's just uh, yeah. Skeptic, is that the right word? A Prince Skeptic? Yeah. Bruce, the, Bruce the only Springsteen, thing I yeah. own by him is the 1999 single I bought that. I thought that yeah, was yeah. a great Bruce song. Springsteen's another one. Wow. Yeah, Incredible. Springsteen, Prince, Madonna. No need. I, I, well, I have I, actually one Madonna record. I'm, I'm one thing I'll shocked. say about Prince. I'm you too. Too. disappointed is what I would say. <laughs> you too. Well. From what I understand, though, the, you know, and I've heard bootlegs, the live experience was completely different yeah. than the records. Genius life, one of the best artists I've ever seen. I think, I think four times, I, brilliant every I, occasion. My, my my analysis from my point of view is that he spent too much time chasing the charts with up to the minute sounds that haven't aged very well. But yeah, I'm not going to. There's no doubt. Parade. There's no doubt about some of the production sounds really, really dated. Your uh, uh, but, your favorites are your favorites, and I know a lot of people great. Out. And like I said, dancing to when doves cry was. An essential part of that those yeah. times. <laughs> that's a good. That's that is a great song. I, um, that's what moves you, isn't it? What it just clicks with you. No one's right. Nobody's wrong. But yeah, oh, it's, exactly, like that. it's exactly that. Yeah, but he's um, not wrong about Prince. But there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll take it. I don't mind being wrong. Rod, where are you going? Number six. <laughs> um, well, you guys might disagree with this as well, by the way. But um, so I know Jeremy's a, a, an Echo and a Bunnyman skeptic, but. Um, <laughs> I, I love Echo and the Bunny Man again. Another band that I, I loved. I loved them all the way through the eighties from their debut, um, <clears throat> Crocodiles, and it was Porcupine, I think. No, Heaven Up Here was a second one. So Heaven Up Here, Ocean Rain's a great album as well. So that was on my short list, I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. Killing Moon on it, and which is a fantastic mm -hmm. song, and other great songs. But Heaven Up Here is my favorite album of theirs, and it's just I think they're an underrated band. Um, mm. Personally, I think they're an, that's an underrated album. I think when you look at critiques and things, it's not it's not it's not ignored, but it's not. They're a great band in terms. Of, he's a great songwriter, but this has got more heft. It's a weightier sound to it. It's if you listen to it, it's, it I think I mentioned it before. It's a very rare thing where it's it's, it's an album. I, I'd never skip a track. I could listen. There's not many albums. A lot of albums you might skip a track, or you just said one track on the Grace Jones thing. This is a no skip album for me. <clears throat> it just it all connects together really well. It's got a feel about it. It's just a fantastic album. It really is. A show of strength. There's a real drive to it, and 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 the mixes of tempos perfectly. There's mm -hmm. the, the slow tracks like All My Colors is is a great track. Uh, no dark things. Um, Turquoise days. Um, it's just it's a really polished top tier. Um, indie album, um, and I just think, yeah, I absolutely love it. And I, and I listen to it, I still listen to it now again, which is why it's in there. Um, and again, I listen to bits of the other albums, but this is if I was going to listen to Echo and the Bunny Man, I'd listen to this album first mm -hmm. without question every time. Um, I just think it's a banger, 1981, I think it was. Mm. Uh, yeah, absolutely love it. Um, number six, yeah. I shall have to go and check them out because I've been I have been an Echo and Bunny Man skeptic. <laughs> you're, an, you're an Echo and a Bunny Man skeptic. <laughs> they have some great songs, uh, no doubt. I, I had a copy of Crocodiles for many years that was actually handed to me by the owner of the Intermetro Record Pool, I, a place I interned when I was in high school. He was like, "You like this new wave stuff, <laughs> that kind of thing." <laughs> and I, you know, I liked it well enough. But when it came time to purge my LPs in 2016, I needed to create some room 
yeah. that one did that one did go out sorry to say but i do like like a song like ocean rain that's pretty tough to deny that song it's pretty great yeah um but but this is sort of angrier and more aggressive yeah and fuller and it's, it's the most powerful album by them by a mile but still melodic i shall check, check it out i think is the phrase mm -hmm. yeah. interesting jeremy what have you got in number six I have yet another Sgt. Pepper's attempt. Elvis Costello and the Attractions, Imperial yeah. Bedroom. He went everyone else one better, though, because he got Jeff Emmerich to help him make the record, who had Dude. been in the studio for Sgt. Pepper's and many other Beatles recordings. Just listened to this again the other day. Every song has so, got so many details on it, but they all work to serve the songs. The songs themselves are incredibly well-written, Obviously, his lyrical facility was always great, but I think it reached a new height on this album. Some of the lines are just, you know, so clever and and powerful, too. The other thing that I think is great about it is that it is a very produced record, but the solid core of the attractions as just brilliant musicians who put power and passion into everything they do is throughout the album. One one thing I have to say is Shabby Doll, the when the when the bass starts going nuts on the outro, I mean it's some of the greatest bass playing of all time. You know, he starts doing these little fills. Bruce Thomas is remarkable. Like, remarkable yeah, bass screaming player. in the background. And oh man, it's just it, it it gets you out of your chair, like I said before. But I really just love this album. And I remember when it came out, it was a little some people poo-pooed it. And at first I wasn't going to get it because trust, which or almost blue, I didn't buy because I, I didn't understand country music at all. So I wasn't going to listen to his version of it at the time. And trust had been a little bit felt a little bit like he was scraping. But then my cousin gave this to me. He was like, you have to have this album. He was visiting from California and he gave this album to me. And I was just blown away. I was like, oh my God, this is the peak, the pinnacle. It can't get any better than this. I don't think it really did, to tell you the truth. There's definitely some what, other good what albums. Year, what year was that, John? 82. This was 1982. 82, okay. I, I love, uh, you know, next was Punch the Clock, which is fine, but it's also got this very clean sound on it. It took him a while to get back to things like uh, Blood and Chocolate was really great. There's, there's definitely other good Elvis Costello. I albums. think Goodbye Cruel World's vastly underrated. I really do. There's I some good songs on there, but the production is absolutely underrated. <laughs> but I'll, I'll come to Elvis Costello later. But go on. <laughs> okay. So anyway, yeah, I, I just think you know he he went he wanted to make an album with a ton of variety. He did it, and it's absolutely brilliant. One of the funniest parts of it is uh, Man Out of Time. Is sort of this epic pop song, but it's bookended by this absolute thrashing that they're doing in the studio. Dun, 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 and he's just going, ah. <laughs> and just like, what is the imagination? Like, where do you get the idea to like glue that on to the beginning and the end of this That's weird, like, absolute gorgeous, you know, epic song? And for some reason, when I when I was a kid and I was listening to this album, the song Town Crier would always, I would always kind of forget about it. And then there was one day I was listening to the album and I just realized, oh my God, Town Crier is a crazy good song with the, the horns and the strings. Oh man, they they just put everything into this album. I think it's absolutely incredible. Steve Naive takes credit. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Steve Naive takes credit for the orchestrations. I mean, what a genius. Great keyboard player. Just everything about it is just perfect. I also love the cover. I think... Recently, he's tried getting back to using these sort of beautiful, ugly paintings. Yes, uh, covers, no, they but they've, they've just been ugly. I'm sorry to say. Like, Blood <laughs> and Chocolate had a great cover. This has a great cover. But some of the more recent ones, I'm like, dude. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a genius. That, again, that, over that, with used genius, but he is. And I've seen him about, must be 30 times or something ridiculous. Oh, is that right? I, I saw him only once on the yeah. Punch the Clock tour. He was absolutely fantastic. Well, I wish I'd seen him earlier than that too. Oh, when, when, brilliant, you know, honestly, model fantastic live, honestly. Uh, my number six is the Water Boys. This is the Sea. 
I, I, I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's the the last of their albums that incorporates the sound, the big music. And you'd incorporate bands like U2, Simple Minds, although Simple Minds were much, much more electronic based earlier on and possibly mm -hmm. the most original of all those bands. The Alarm, uh, Big Country, that, that, that group of Celtic sort of bands, they all had that sort of sound. Uh, but of all those albums and the bands, this is for me the best of them all. Um, it, in terms of that, sounds it reminds me different again. But uh, it's just it's just a brilliant album. Um, it's sort of it's fairly fierce. It's got something about it. It's, his influences are clearly on his sleeve. You know the likes of Patti Smith, Van Morrison, Dylan, Lou Reed. You can hear them all. But he does a brilliant, brilliant job. It kicks off with a superb sort of don't bang me drums. It's got the whole of the moon overplayed. I have to say, even Prince covered it. Um, it's, it's overplayed. Medicine Bow's fantastic. It's almost got an Eddie and the Hot Rods feel to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Old England is brilliant, clearly about Thatcher and the decline of Britain. Uh, Be My Enemy, very Dylan, very sub sub uh, subterranean homesick blues. It's got a real sort mm -hmm. of, there's a clear link between both songs. Mm -hmm. Trumpets is one of the best love songs ever written, in my opinion. It's got the the fantastic line of, your life is like an ocean. I want to dive in naked, lose myself in the depths. To be with you is the best of dreams. I think it's just a fantastic lyric. And it's just him playing the piano. He's playing mm. the piano badly, but the mood and the atmosphere is so beautiful. It's it's sensational. And then it finishes what off with a, literally a song with, I think it's got two or three chords maximum. This is the scene. It's about six, seven minutes long. Yeah, it's very Van Morrison, very astral weeks. It's got mm. that real feel to it. And it's beautiful pastoral sort of feel the album is nothing short of sensational it really isn't it could easily be much higher as i see i'll just toss these up in the air and it's, <laughs> it's it's just one of those albums i come to again and again and i play it on a regular basis and i, I know he doesn't like it but i don't think they've written a better album since and uh, it's one of those where he loves the album, but he's like, it's, it's almost like an albatross to him because he, he went off on right. so many different tangents, which is absolutely fine as a songwriter. I think you have to. You can't be locked in one sound, can you? But um, mm. for me, that is the definitive album by him. So, yeah, that's my number six. I need to listen to that. It, it, it sounds like it would touch a lot of the things that I like. I know yeah. I've heard songs by them and maybe even listened to the whole album. Yeah, the second and the third yeah, albums are, 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 are brilliant. Really, are great. No, I, I, I don't like you with the bunny man. I swear, I'd probably go back and listen to. The, I haven't listened to that whole album. I don't yeah. think I've heard bits like Jeremy. I, I'm aware of them and I've heard some of their stuff. But, um, I do like. I do like. I do like that kind of Celtic. Yeah, it's very much got that Celtic feel. It's yeah. a, it's a, also what's lovely about it. It's all. It's almost like a suite because it's so well sequenced. And it's got a whole feel and theme running right through the album. It's not just a mishmash of songs thrown together. It's It's got a real feel. So, yeah, I think that's another reason why it really stands out. Marvellous album for him, for me. So, there. Uh, Ger uh, Rod, we've got number five. Um, number five, um, again, another artist uh, um, who's been going for a lot longer, but Peter Gabriel had to have an album in his 80s output. And obviously... Um, Car was just before that, but his 80s output is top notch again, really. Yeah. Um, and it's a toss up between, um, although I like security, it's a toss up between Melt and So. Um, mm. And again, I went with the the big one, really. So it's just, it's partly because it's got Don't Give Up on it, which, <laughs> which again, it's a well known song, but it's just a fantastic song. It's one of my favorite songs of all time, I think. As, as a slow ballad. It was supposed to be Dolly Parton singing with him. I know, yeah. <laughs> I know, and she turned... She turned. I, don't know. I don't think that would have worked. <laughs> no, I, think, I think it worked out quite well in the end. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just exquisite. You know, the lyrics, his vocals, uh, her vocals as well in, in the chorus, but his vocals on that at times are just unreal. And he's, he's a great vocalist anyway. Brilliant. But it's, just, it's, it's banger after banger, isn't it? You know, so it yeah. opens, with red, opens with Red Rain, I think. Yeah. Just this, you know, just a great sounding track red rain it's also got poppy ones on it like sledgehammer which won awards galore for its video and all the rest of it big times on it as well yeah another sort of mainstream poppy song but but really clever satirical lyrics woven around a great melody um in your eyes stunning song live it's incredible yeah in your eyes. i mean he's done many live versions of it extended ones with your know, world music people invited on stage hasn't he, and all that kind of thing but 
it just it just works and and as an album it's it's a really powerful piece of work you know and it's his most it's his commercially his most successful but i suppose it's really impressive that you think that someone can do you know some quite obscure stuff like his early genesis stuff was mental i mean some of it brilliant yeah you know, so it, I mean, even his haircuts and his costumes. I mean, yeah. when you look back and you watch some of the footage, and again, he's fantastic live. He always has been, hasn't he? Yeah. But some of that stuff's like really experimental, really proggy stuff that's quite inaccessible, you know, mm. and hard to hard to reach, if you know what I mean, and very experimental. And then not so long later, he can come out with a, a piece of work that's so polished and so well-constructed and so well-written with just, he's just an outstanding artist. Genius. Uh, again, what's fascinating, I think it's I think it's this way around. It might be the other way around. He knocks Genesis off the number one album slot in America. <laughs> <laughs> with, with, that album. with that album, yeah. Did he? I don't know. That's well. He, he he doesn't strike me as the sort of guy that find that satisfying. You know? I mean, I well, know he gets on well with all the lads, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've seen a few reunions. I've yeah. watched a few yeah. reunions on YouTube, which yeah. are really quite interesting when they talk about Lamb Lies Down and making yeah. some of the albums and stuff. It's really quite interesting stuff. But um, but I love Mel as well. So that that came close because yeah, yeah Mel and Mel Think Security are probably my favorite song based Peter Gabriel albums. But yeah. my number one from him is Passion. It it didn't make this list, but the Passion soundtrack stuff yeah. he did for Scorsese's movie. All right, yeah, yeah. That album is just amazing. Just the perfect blend of you know bringing in all these influences from Africa and and Arab countries. With his art rock stuff, just so good. Yes. Well, he he, he 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 kind of he popularized world music, didn't he? You know, with Absolutely the WOMAD, WOMAD festival, and yeah. mm -hmm. you know he was behind all that. Yeah. And you know he, he's a he's an activist. He's he, he's just a great great bloke, great bloke, great singer, great artist. Yeah. Uh, so I picked so anyway, and um, it might be a bit obvious, but you can't really deny it. I've seen him twice redo the whole album live on the back to front I mean, to us. Brilliant. And then, and then he's just and then his most recent album, like last earlier this year, was it or last year? Got yeah, to number one. Just got last year. One, yeah. Got to number one again, didn't it? I think. Was it this year? I can't remember. No, I've seen <laughs> him on the, I've seen him on the tour. I've seen him on the tour, yes. Yeah, so I can't remember what it was now. I number, saw number two in London. Yeah, number number one again. Because he yeah. I think he was quite surprised and humbled that. It, it did it did as well. And you've been 20 years since his last album. So. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's yeah, beloved he, though, that's for sure. He's yeah, a, but well deserved though. Great choice, great great choice, great choice. Uh, Jeremy, what have you got on at number five? I have another album I read about in the New York Times and just had to hear <laughs> it because it was a band from Minneapolis. They had made inroads in New York, but I was at college, so I didn't know about any of their club dates in like '83 or '82 if they did that. But this is from 1984. Let It Be by The Replacements. Mm. This is their third studio album. And I just remember putting it on. And the first chords you hear of the song, I Will Dare, I, I fell in love absolutely from the first notes of that song. It's just such a great song. And the album is kind of all over the place. They have these very silly songs. You know, Tommy gets his tonsils out. And then they have heartbreaking songs like 16 Blue, it's just this, you know, Paul Westerberg, brilliant songwriter. He can write a rocker. He can write a ballad. And there's something so powerful when he does a ballad, though. There's a song here called Androgynous. When you think about 1984, obviously, we've had androgyny in rock music with Bowie and T-Rex and those kind of things. But this song, Androgynous, is really more about the internal experience of not knowing exactly where you are on the gender spectrum rather than I'm going to dress up and and be a, a feminine character for a day. You know, it's just a deep, deep song. They cover a Kiss song, Black Diamond. I it, To me, I always say this justified the existence of Kiss. Just because they made a song. That was... Something I too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Favorite thing. Senior video, Unsatisfied. It's just a gorgeous song. Look me in the eye and tell me that you're satisfied. You know, you just hear that and you're like, <laughs> like you don't want to look in the mirror after you listen to that song. <laughs> and the last song is Answering Machine, all about the frustration. If you can't get through to somebody, you just keep getting their answering machine. And it's this sort of 
guitar collage backing it up. They had ambitions beyond being just a, you know, they started out almost as a hardcore band. People always said, oh, they weren't hardcore enough or they were, they, they were just not right for that genre. They're just a yeah. great American rock band. And this was obviously their last album on an independent label. They signed, signed to Sire. They released Tim, fantastic record. Just listened to that the other day. Pleased to Meet Me came after that. With each of these albums, I was like, they're going to be the biggest band in the world. And then something would always happen. And if you read the book Bob Marrow wrote called Trouble Boys, it's actually quite disturbing, some of the things that happened. They could not seem to get out of their own way to the extent of you know, destroying studio equipment when they had an opportunity to record, I think it was at Bearsville Studio in Woodstock, New York. Some of the best records ever made were made up there. They they literally just wrecked the place. You know, but they still made a lot of really great records when you think about it. They just never had the total success that they could have had. Yeah. Their concerts were legendary for being either complete messes or completely brilliant. The one I saw was fortunately completely brilliant. They just came out and played their songs. This was still when Bob Stinson was in the band. Bob Stinson was a guy who had prog rock taste. And he could play like that too. So you get these guitar solos that are just like soaring, complex, beautiful guitar sounds. And Westerberg just has this great, you know, whiskey cigar or whiskey and cigarettes voice. Just absolutely such a great record. And funny story about this album is that I, I bought it and I brought it back to my apartment on campus and my roommate absolutely loved it too. And I went away on vacation and came back and, and record was sounded terrible. He told me he'd been playing it two or three times a day so he could learn each song and the grooves were just wrecked. It's So he bought me another copy. So I have two copies, <laughs> two 1984 pressings of Let It Be. And this one also turned out to end up sounding fine a while later when I played it again. But but something had gone. But that's like the kind of the way this record got under our skin. It's just an absolutely incredible record. And, you know, I also love that, you know, the cheek of calling it let it be and and then a picture of them on a roof you know it's just kind of saying like you know beatles ha you know they don't they don't have anything on us <laughs> yeah good album great choice actually i have to say it. I, I really like that album it's a really good album my number five i've gone down the elvis costello route as well i could have chosen five albums i would say <laughs> maybe six from the 1980s and i've gone with king of america I think it's absolutely sublime. It really is. It's it's a top, top, top album. Uh, generally features most of uh, Elvis Presley's backing band at some point, mm -hmm. PCBs. James Burton, Jerry Sheff on bass, who obviously was a bass player for The Doors a little bit as well, of course, on LA Woman. And uh, mm -hmm. bizarrely went to come and live in Northumberland, just up where I live. Uh, I had the good fortune of seeing them at Newcastle City Hall, that band, in mm -hmm. 1987, I think it was. I was front row, and it was one of the best gigs I've ever been to. I think Elvis did just under three hours. He did like a bit well on his own, and then with the band, I have to say James Burton's guitar playing was next level. It was just incredible mm. to watch. Watch an absolute incredible musician flying around the guitar, making it look so easy. The band were great. They played the double bass with Jerry Sheff. The band, the drum was magnificent. Costello was on top, top form. Um, and he, he literally released like two albums within about eight months. It was that and Blood and Chocolate Watch. Your book, I know, it's absolutely killer albums. Yeah. Um, but I've gone with this ahead of it. I just think it's 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 a remarkable album. It's stripped down. It's produced by, by um, oh, what's his name again? I forgot the guy. T Bone Burnett. That's it, the big uh, T Bone Burnett. And it's got that sound, that stripped down Americana feel to it. Costello's voice is superb on it. He's did some real highlights, like um, indoor fireworks, little palaces, beautifully mm. slow, crafted songs. Um, you, he would then go on and influence, of course, the likes of Springsteen, Melling, John Mellencamp, Robert Plant later on as well, of course, with Alison Krauss type albums. Uh, he did a great version of Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood by Nina Simone. Got some real nice fast country Americana on like the, the big light, lovable, just superb. Uh, the, mm. the attractions feature once, I think it's the last song, isn't it? Sleep of the Just, which is a great song. 
And it's, I think it's a remarkable album. I really do. I think it's just an incredible album. Um, the, the band is such a good choice to go with. And it's so different to Blood and Chocolate, which is, again, as I say, just a great album. Um, it's, yeah, fabulous. Go and listen to it. It's so different. For me, it's, it, it is his best album of the 80s, but I could have picked five. Uh, yeah, five no, I, I love that album a lot. Um, and so, uh, I see that it's coming. They're they're releasing a huge box yeah, set coming out in the next week. I can't wait. I'm absolutely in America and other it. realms. Ninety seven tracks. Dying to hear. I cannot wait. So I'm really looking forward to that. So but yeah. now I want to look on YouTube and see if there's any of those concerts. I didn't realize they took that band on the road. Yeah, they took them on the road. There is a concert. There is a concert. I think it might be Tokyo or something. But there, there is a concert mm -hmm. on YouTube. Um, That's yeah, amazing. I was privileged to see it. It was just. It's in my top 10 gigs of all time, without without mm. doubt. Mm -hmm. It's the first time I ever saw them. So, yeah, that's my number five. Rod, what have you got at number four? Uh, number four, um, another favourite band of mine who had a stellar 80s um, and beyond um, was R.E.M. I had to have an R.E.M. album in there. Um, could have been a few contenders. Because um, <laughs> they, they went from Merma was a debut. Was that 82, I think? Um, then Reckoning... Then my favorite is Document. That's my favorite album by them. Just probably, yeah, doc, Document just had a reckoning, I think. Great. Murmur's seen as a great debut as well. But it is. Document, I don't know, Document's sort of like, again, it's, it's like a punctuation point between college rock band and arena rock band. And then Document's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of a bit more rocky and a bit more heft than the earlier ones but it's still got the melodies um and it's got three singles on it i think i think finest work song was a single but then it's got two of the biggest singles or their singles of the 80s one i love and the end of the world as we know it Bellas. which are just well they're just both belters and both ones that are just instantly recognizable everybody knows them the the, the intro for one i love the riffs just yeah Fun. Again, sounds as good today as it did then, doesn't it? Yeah. Unlike some some music can age, that hasn't aged. Um, I love exhuming McCarthy. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, and then you've got things like the, um, the King of Birds and Lightning Hopkins and nothing like the other tracks, really. They're quite different, but they work within the album. And I just think that, yeah, I love R.E.M. anyway. I mean, but I think Document stands alone a little bit because you've got the sort of like out of time and then what out for the people that great songs as well you know you've got things like night swimming and everybody hurts and you know real melodic uh, more accessible i suppose and then college rock prior to that i think document stands on its own a bit like new adventures in hi-fi stands on its own yeah which yeah. i love as well for completely different reasons not about all Max, yeah yeah it got i mean it's, it's a bit of a it's a bit divisive album it seems but i I really like it. New Adventures in Hi-Fi, you know, Electrolight, and it's got some really good songs on there. But isn't um, Ebo the Letter on there as well? I think is, it, is Ebo the Letter on New Adventures? I think it's got some great songs on. It. It's got a real, but they, they stand alone a little bit from the, the rest of their stuff. But I, I always think I describe them as sort of um, the indie Beach Boys <laughs> with a with better lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so the harmonies and, and the backing vocals <laughs> and the melodies are, are Beach Boys esque, yeah. um, but they're, they've got stream of consciousness, you know, meaningful, deep, cerebral lyrics. You know, so they're like, yeah, so sort of like a, a, a brainy Beach Boys. Well, Peter Buck was a real student of the 60s, yeah, the and you guitar player, so he he really understood like the birds and the Beach Boys. Yeah, and you, you can hear the birds that. all over them, can't you? You get that, don't you? But but they're much edgier, yeah. You? you know, and and um, and then Stipe's got this kind of hypnotic, sort of mesmeric kind of vocal style, hasn't he? That just draws you in. Very I unique, you know. I mean, obviously unique, unique is in itself, isn't um, it? unique, but obviously, yeah. Uh... Yeah, and I just think so. That's my favorite album of theirs. And again, if I was going to play an album, I'd probably play that album the most mm -hmm. of their albums again. Yeah. So, yeah, for using me, my, using my one. Sorry, I bought that as soon as it came out. And I loved Murmur, and I still love Murmur. Yeah, Murmur's great. And we, we, we came to a parting of the ways right around side two of Reckoning. I just felt like something was had been lost. But uh, I was... You prefer Murmur to Reckoning, do you? I prefer Murmur to any of their records. Oh, it's the only one I own. Well, no, actually, I still own Reckoning, but every once in a while I think about selling it. 
I, I just don't listen to it. And I, I saw them in concert and everybody was calling for Rockville, Rockville. I was like, oh no, they're they're a pop band now. <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously I was a little more ideological back then than I am now yeah, when sure. it comes to music. But, but it they just, can, just they can not, be a pop band. It wasn't to yeah. my taste anymore. It's great but, choice. Uh, I just played Murmur like two days ago for the for the Twitter poll and i still love that album i think murmur is absolutely it's filled with all these great production choices and yeah i just love it but we can't go down that road no <laughs> no i just got i think i picked document as my yeah. rem selection if you like and again i couldn't have a, an 80s top 10 without them having an album in it so i yeah, hard to disagree on that really. choice actually i think it's a great choice i do i think it's a great choice um yeah, really cool choice, actually. Uh, Jeremy, what have you got at number four? Number four, I have The Blue Mask. Oh, I okay. Believe. Actually, 11 years ago today that we're taping this, that we mm, lost. That's right. The Master. This was the first album of his I bought just when it came out. Mm -hmm. Because Street Hassle, which was the last good album he had put out, was a little before my time of getting into Lou Reed. I bought this album. Actually, I I got it as a you know an open demonstration album. So sorry, Lou, you didn't get your royalties from me, but you got many of them later on. Trust me. <laughs> but one thing I love about this album is, in a way, it's so simple and spacious. It's just those two guitars, bass, and drums. And he always said, you know, you can't beat two guitars, bass, and drums. Of course, when the other guitarist is Robert Quine a second mention of him you can't really lose the guy was an absolute genius i got to see them perform after legendary hearts came out which was the album after this and that was quine and fred Mayer, who was also the drummer on the squiddy politi album and fernando saunders this amazing melodic bass player this album has a different drummer but it's still quine saunders and reed and one of the things that quine did was he told Lou Reed, he said, you really have to play guitar on this album too. Like, I'm not going to carry the whole album. So the dialogue between the two of them is absolutely incredible. And I remember when I saw them in concert, they did this song on here, which is called Women. You know, I love women. I think they're great. They're <laughs> solace to the world in a, in a terrible state. You know, I mean, the lyrics are kind of silly on that song, but but they're from the heart. And when when... I remember when we, when I saw him in concert, he played this solo that was essentially one note that he just sustained throughout the period. Absolutely mind blowing. And, and this concert that I saw was actually videotaped and released as an evening with Lou Reed. Oh, I've seen it. Yes, I've seen yeah. it. Yeah, small in, in, in the end, at the end, they go into the they go backstage. The camera like goes backstage, yep. and he's sort of sitting there, and he goes, he goes, I think I actually left the ground during that solo on you know and and it was like he said it perfectly anyway but not to get away from the blue mask itself the album is it's filled with characters you know when you think about the song the gun he's carrying a gun he knows how to use it he's not singing about himself he's creating a character and a very dangerous scary mm. character but then there's songs like the day john kennedy died which is really written from an autobiographical perspective he remembers being in a bar, watching the football game, and then the guy in a Porsche somewhere honked his horn and said they shot the can, you know, and he just tells it in a way that for someone like me who was born in 64, so I never crossed paths with JFK, he, he you know, he was killed a year before I was yeah. born, but this was the kind of thing that made it have the impact that it must have had on somebody at those times. You know, even a young man like Lou Reed, who was obviously counterculture from the day he was born for whatever reason we don't we'll never know why but he was struck by this and and saddened by it so I, it's just a brilliant brilliant album then he's got average guy on here i'm just an average guy you know which is just sort of like cutting against that counterculture uh core that he had my house is just a beautiful song this kind of woodsy thing and he's singing about the ghost of delmore schwartz who was this great poet who had taught him when he was at Syracuse University, seeing about Delmore Schwartz's ghost occupying this house he was living in the woods. You know, this was a period where he had gotten clean. He was off everything. 
he had he was with a new wife and she was kind of really helping organize him and it's just so with all that foundation the domestic happiness he was really able to just create and it's just an absolutely incredible album the blue mask is another one that's just terrifying i mean he's creating these scenarios and characters that are just as dark as it comes you know we're talking cormac mccarthy dark right okay people, people slicing up other people and you know it's just there's like horror on this album and beauty it's just absolutely a wonderful record i love the blue mask kind of funny that it was sort of a rebirth for him and they you know took the photo from transformer i think that was his his wife's idea sylvia she came up with the idea yes. to do that i think that he was sort of like making a statement like i'm back i'm running on all cylinders because the two previous albums the bells and growing up in public were had their moments but were pretty disappointing compared to the level of something like street hassle so just an absolutely incredible album i think one that may be slightly underrated in this in these days you know with new york being so praised mm. And and then you know more recent stuff, people are are still discovering Lou Reed albums, and this is a great one to discover. Check it out because I haven't. Uh, it's not one I've. It's not one I've sort of listened to. If I'm being perfectly honest, so I shall. Uh, I shall give it a play. Right. Well, my number four. You might as well cover your ears now. The pair of you here. Uh, <laughs> did you buy what you were saying before? I've gone with Bruce Springsteen's "The Tunnel of Love." <laughs> which I, I think is a truly. Oh, you picked album. his best album, though. <laughs> so I could have, I could have picked the river, which is brilliant. I could have picked Born in the USA, um, which would, Rasta. which are both great albums in my opinion, anyway. Um, <laughs> and Nebraska is very, very good. Uh, but Tunnel of Love is fantastic. It follows on bizarrely from the Elvis Costello album before. It's the same sound. It's mm. that Americana laid back album. It's it's his divorce album. It's basically mm -hmm. an album describing a, about the relationship he's in, and, and it's clear when you listen to the album he's going to get divorced very soon, and mm -hmm. that the, 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 the marriage is falling apart. And it's a very sad album, but it's beautiful in equal measure. It's very sparse. The production's very open, beautiful. Uh, his, his songwriting craft is magnificent. Very Costello, actually. It really is mm -hmm. very Costello. I mean, brilliant disguise. Costello covered it, and it's a yeah. it's a beautiful track. I, my my band do it occasionally, you know, or I'll do it <laughs> live on my own. Uh, it's some real great songs, and the Tunnel of Love was great. The opener is just fantastic. I ain't got you. I used to do that with my old blues band because he just <laughs> plays acoustic guitar on it, but it's like basically a Bo Diddley rhythm. So we used to play it the Bo <laughs> Diddley style, and it used to go down a storm. It's a super song. Um, it's, it's just great songs on it. Great lyrics. Tougher than the rest and spare part about gaining mm. relationship falling apart. Um, Walk like a man tells a story. That's the one art song on it, which is slightly different. That could have been mm. on like Nebraska. Uh, when you're alone, you're alone. Again, very sad, very somber. <laughs> and then Valentine, the last track on it is it's very long. It's just like a, a like a double bass, acoustic, him singing, tons of space. Um, and again, it's about a dissolving relationship. But it's it's weird because it's his most depressing album in terms of the fact that it's all about breakups. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's I would describe it as almost like Bob Dylan's Blood on the Tracks type of album, you know? Yeah. That sort of thing. I think it's as good as that. I think it's a fantastic album. I really think it's a really a, a magnificent and underappreciated album. Everybody always That was one he made without the E Street band. Right? Without the, the E Street band feature on a couple of tracks, or like maybe half the tracks, bits of them are on bits and bobs. But it's certainly not a full E Street Band album. It doesn't have that big shine and bombast that they yeah. sometimes have. It's got none of that. It's just a very, very stripped down, laid back album. I see a very similar like Costello's King of America. So I could easily have flipped either way that either of those albums <laughs> go. It's, it really didn't really matter to be honest. So yeah, that's the Tunnel of Love that. is one of those Springsteen songs that I would actually choose to listen to. I think it's a fantastic song. And the whole album is solid. Yeah. I also love the song I'm on Fire from Born in the USA. USA that's a yeah. Great, great song. You know, every everyone hits it once in a while, even if you're not a fan. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like Tom Petty, Free Falling is a great, great song. Yeah, I have absolutely. no love for anything else. But you know, I think when you're when you're working at that level where you've got this huge fan base, but there may be people who 
it doesn't work for them, but you're yeah, still going to hit once or twice. Some of the big yeah. fans, like, you know, you're, you're born in the USA fans. This is so different to born in the USA. Yeah. We, um, that, that yeah. I, I think it must have freaked out a number of fans because they must have went, well, what the hell is this? Yeah, <laughs> that's, the well, that's, bra that's bravery from a songwriter's point of view for me because you could have easily just yeah. write, right, I'm doing born in the USA too, but he didn't. Yeah. I've done an absolutely different alley and it's a magnificent album. It really is. So there, that's my choice. What have you got at number three, Rod? Um, number three, I've got one of my favourite artists of all time, and it's a go-to album that has been for many, many years, um, as are a lot of his albums. Um, it's Gil Scott Heron, oh. um, Reflections, from 1981. Um, there's only seven tracks. Um, it starts off with a reggae song called Storm Music, which has got a really great groove, great brass on there. Um, then then a, there's two covers, one of Grandma's Hands by Bill Withers, which is a really, really nice song. take on Grandma's Hands. And the other one is Inner City Blues, a cover of Inner City Blues by Marvin Gaye. Mm -hmm. but, but So it's quite faithful. But then there's a whole rap spoken word section at the end, which is really political and angry and in Gil Scott Heron, styly. Um, very sort of, um, it's very, it was, it was sort of, he was riling against Reaganomics largely on this yeah. album. Um, that that he's doing that on the inner city blues. He kind of he kind of mixes it up so that it becomes current to you know the, the current situation in eighty one, um, which was ironically similar to the situation in seventy one when what when inner city blues came out. Yeah. And ironically, and ironically, all he's singing about on this album is as pertinent today as it was in nineteen eighty one. Argue and, and in terms of Trump. He's like Reagan on steroids, so it's, <laughs> yeah. even so it's even more pertinent. And then, yeah. and then there's an anti one of one of my favorite anti one of the great anti gun songs called Gun, which is just got a really great groove to it. But it's it's all about um, everybody's got a pistol, everyone's got a forty five, and slagging off the NR, NRA and all sorts. It's just a great mm -hmm. song. And then and then it's it's bookended at the end of the the album's a twelve minute. Um, a Serbic rant against Reagan called B Movie, which is just yeah, that's a good title. That like that's clever as well. Of I, course. I don't know if you heard that track, but ly lyrically it's as good as anything Dylan's written, yeah. and I'm not even exaggerating. You know, it's just pure poetry. Some of the some of the wordplay and the you know the imagery and, and metaphors are just stunning on that track. Um, yeah, he was a genius. He was, and, um, it's just it's just a go to album. I listen to it. I still listen to it now. Um, I listen to it when I'm walking the dog. <laughs> on my headphones. <laughs> Just a favorite. Uh, he's a real favorite artist of mine. I've seen him live a few times. Oh, you Thank saw you. him? Wow. Thank I you never got to see him. My sister saw him and said it was amazing. Yeah, he's amazing. He had a great band with him. He, he had different bands. He had the Amnesiac Express once when I went to see him. And then and then I can't remember who he, he played in Oxford with another band. And they were just great musicians, up, up uh, upright basses and brass sections and him on the keyboards and he's just got such a rich baritone voice and and it's genuine fusion music because there's there's reggae yeah um, I, I, I didn't mention is that jazz there's a track called is that jazz which is mm -hmm. is that jazz but it's a very jazzy track so you've got r b jazz rap reggae but they all work um fantastically well and he's yeah what well, he's called the godfather of rap i think isn't he now was seen seen as that because kanye yeah. went Kendrick Lamar, all Both these him and, and the last poets, those kind of yeah, they, 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 they get contributed. Sound a lot they were they were and referenced they a lot put something into the DNA of, of hip hop. Yeah, absolutely, sure. yeah, totally. Because they, they did spoken word before anybody else did, and you know, and it was that was late late sixties, early seventies civil rights stuff, wasn't it? And, yeah. um Revolution will not be televised and all that kind of thing. But yeah. this was eighty one. Eighty one. It's still a masterful album. You yeah, know, his delivery is just fantastic. Um, so yeah, it's an album I listen to all the time. Number three, I have I have three bootlegs: seventy six, eighty three, and ninety two, and they're all completely different and all amazing. Yeah, he's, he really was an incredible live performer too. Just yeah, so good. and very engaging. He tell yeah, he, yeah. He spoke. He spoke he, little anecdotes, anecdotes with the audience. Anecdotes with the yeah, audience. Like the songs, yeah, brilliant, absolutely great to watch. And, great um, choice. Mm -hmm. A fantastic artist and deserves to be. In the, even though it's the 80s, more of a 70s artist with pieces. Yeah, I was just thinking of them as Winter in America, America and, and all that, but but 80, yeah. that was 81 and it was just still bang on to me. And then his last album, I'm New Here. I'm New Here, fantastic album. Was a, It was a bit of a tough listen, I think, but 
but still <clears> great <throat> in its own the right. remix version by Jamie XX. We're new here. Really good. Incredible. Incredible, yeah. And then Makai McRaven did another reworking of I listened it to that recently, actually. A couple of years ago, and that was really good too. So. Yeah. It was quite dark though, and, and yeah. Har harrowing, wasn't it? His version. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not a happy They were very one. personal, weren't they, about his, his, his personal, about his upbringing and, and his grandmother bringing him up and, and yeah. stuff like that. It was some, some pretty hard hitting stuff. But yeah, he's, he's a great artist. Great. Great choice. choice, really good choice. Actually, different. That's nice to see something a little bit unusual. Cool, good, 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 good. Jeremy, what have you got at number three? I have the last album released. Ah, good. Bob Marley, excellent. Live. Uprising. I talked about it a lot on our Bob Marley show. Yeah, yeah. it's a really, really. Just Check it out, folks. Check out the Bob Marley show. Uprising. I won't say too much about it. I yeah. probably said at the time that. You know, in my high school band, we were trying to make sort of post-punk art salsa music. I can't even describe what we were trying to do. But when when the rehearsal was over, we danced to Off the Wall by Michael Jackson and Uprising by Bob Marley. That's why I don't have a vinyl copy of it, because I just listened to my friend's copy all the time. <laughs> so I didn't buy it at the time and, uh, you know, got it on CD years later. It's just an absolutely gorgeous album. One of my favorite songs is Forever Loving Ja, which is pure reggae gospel. It's just a hymn, and it just has this haunting melody. And I probably talked about this before, but when I saw him live, he performed that song the only time he ever did it. And I just remember standing there, just jaw dropped. I felt like he was singing that song just for me. And just fantastic. And, and the idea that he was incorporating American pop into a song like Could You Be Loved, you know, it has a different kind of rhythm to it. He's getting into like dance pop, American R&B, just absolutely incredible production on here. Fantastic, you know, they were some of the best musicians ever. When you think about how versatile it had to be to go from Exodus, Survival, and then this sound, which was very different. Yeah. So I, it's just an absolutely great album. Bob Marley, who knows what he how he would have defined the 80s had he lived. But this album had a long ripple effect for me. So he did yeah. have to find We talk it. about it loads in our show and I mention it a lot. And it's, it is right up there. It's an absolutely incredible album. Absolutely top, top notch. Uh, great choice, as you know. As you know, super. My number three is this. <laughs> it's the protector. I was waiting for it. I saw you wearing it. It's uh, I've got the signed album on the wall, actually. I'll I'll show it on the on the on the bottom of the screen when I put the things on. Um <laughs> by all four of them. And it's the first Pretenders album. So my next three albums, folks, all come from 1980, which is <laughs> a super loaded year for me. And the Pretenders yeah. first album, I saw Chrissy Hines Pretenders twice in the last week. Uh <laughs> and I saw them at London just a couple of days ago at the Palladium, and her voice is incredible for 73. It sounds exactly the same as it did 40 years ago. It's absolutely remarkable, her voice. Uh, but the first album is, I think, possibly the greatest debut album of all time. I think it's untouchable. Um, it's, it's just everything about it is brilliant. The production by Chris Thomas is superb. Mm. The opening, you know, the belting off with Precious and the bit of swearing going on, that tells you the sort of sort of band that they're not going to take any rubbish. But there's some beautiful sort of pop hits on it as well. The band are great musicians. James Honeyman Scott, for me, he's the missing sort of link. He's the of, of guitar players, you know, between your rock and roll guitarist and Johnny Moore. He's in the middle somewhere. He's got that sort of twangy sound, really unique sound. And I know Johnny Moore's a huge, huge fan. He was in The Pretenders for a short while as well, of course. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a remarkable album with some great songs on it, you know, uh, Tattoo, Love, Boys, Kid, sort of song about prostitution and that. It's very sad. Private Life is incredible. Grace Jones did an incredible cover of it, by the way. And I was going to say, definitive. Private Life the other day was the highlight of the set. It was, again, amazing. Uh, Mystery Achievement, one of the great songs, clearly influenced, dare I see it, The Stone Roses, I Am The Resurrection, which doesn't make my list, folks. Let me put that out there. and I'm sure it'll come top of Rich's number one list when <laughs> people end up voting for it. But... Um, but uh, it's, it's clearly influenced it. 
Uh, it, it's right up there. It's, it's an absolute masterpiece of an album, and again, an album that's so well fitted together in terms of this, in terms of the structure of the songs, which order they're going to go in, and the sound. And there are different sounds on there because you've got the punk rockish type of sound, then you've got the guitar, sort of that twangy rock and roll sort of fifties guitar sound, and then you've got the classic rock sound on Mystery Achievement. So, and then the reggae, really good reggae sound on Private Life, actually. Uh, and so it's a it's it's a really diverse album. Yet yeah, everything gels so well together. Her songwriting's brilliant, by the way, of course. But her voice is so unique. It's so different. I mean, you you listen. It's it's like Brian Ferry. You know who's singing within one note. You know immediately mm -hmm. it's Chrissy Hind, uh, and she's got such a distinct voice and so beautiful. And she's such a such a well thought through in terms of a phrasing as well as a singer. A phrasing is magnificent. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing but nothing but praise for me. It, it really is a sensational album. Um, it could easily be number one for me as well. And can I just add there, and I mentioned this to Rich, it came out originally in December the 27th, 1979. But in America, it came out in 1980. And so we've gone with the American one because Discogs have got it listed wrong. And I don't know why, but it was definitely it was definitely 27th of December, 1979. And there you have it. Brass and Pocket was also one of the first number ones in 1980 as well. Um, great song, which my eldest daughter was born to. So there we have it. Sorry, youngest daughter was born to. Beg your pardon. So they're a very special album. It really is. Um, the Pretenders. So Rod, we've got number two. Um, yeah, I've got a post-punk crossover um, from our previous show. I've got Closer at number two. Mm. Again, 1980 again, isn't it? Um, yeah. And yeah, one album to start a decade off with, really. Um, and to finish the other decade off with. Actually. <laughs> yeah. so they, finished, they finished the other decade off with um, their other album, which was Sublime as well. Um, I, I, we spoke about it on the previous show. It's just it's bleak and dark <laughs> and but sort of majestically so really you know it's just it's it's sort of it's kind of beautiful isn't it it is Even it's so it's, it's so dark too. It just you keep moving forward yeah those drums and no matter how bad it gets you <clears throat> keep going <laughs> yeah there is a drive through it. it. Just it drives, it does drive along, and it opens with the exhibition. We're talking about drums. I mean, yeah, it, that's the opening track, isn't it? I mean, it's just like it's quite sort of um, kind of dysregulates you a little bit, doesn't it? In terms of the yeah, the off kilter kind of the style of it and stuff. It's and almost it's, a bit like "For Your Pleasure" song by Roxy Music. It's almost yeah. got that sort of little feel to it. Yeah, and then you've got isolation, and then. Um, and then just all they're all great songs, really. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, it's heart and soul, and and I know you're a big fan of Twenty Four Hours, another great Absolutely. song. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. And again, it it's it's a seminal album, isn't it? And and incredibly influential, and you know, people from all genres, I think, probably reference it. You know, mm -hmm. and to be around so briefly, I think, and to have that impact. You know, I'm not saying nobody's done that. You know, the, the Doors weren't around for Yonks, were they? But but they still had quite a lot more records than these guys did. To, yeah. to, have, two, to have two albums and and have, I don't know, make that amount of noise and, and make that mark is it just speaks volumes to me. And I know some people, they're not everybody's cup of tea because of the nature of the music and it's too, yeah. it is too dark and too bleak and too miserable, you know, too miserable for some people, isn't it? But it's... It's unique. It's heartfelt. It's painful. It's joyous. It's every, everything that's life. It's just life itself <laughs> in, in an album, <laughs> in an achingly fabulous manner. Really, <laughs> yeah. Great, great choice, though. I have to say, Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. it could have been number one, but yeah, it's not quite. But yeah. great choice. Absolutely great choice, Jeremy. What have you got in at number two? I have uh, my number one Talking Heads album. Remain in light. Yeah. I, I remember leaving this off the post punk show and feeling kind of bad about it or fear of music. I didn't put on there either, but that was obviously the seventies, but this album is just too good. Even though it was my number one on the talking Heads show, it really just 
it still blows my mind when you listen to it, the energy of it and the artfulness. They managed to combine that. You know, it was recorded. They did the basic tracks all live in the studio down in Nassau. And then Eno and Byrne took it back and just did all this stuff to it. And I think it's that combination of that furious energy and the extra, you know, Nona Hendrix is in there and lots of great people they had helping them along the way. But, uh, you know, at the cores, those four players, they were remarkable instrumentalists. They, they, they all move around the instruments on this album. It's not, you know, you, you might be listening to Jerry Harrison play bass. It doesn't matter though. It's just yeah. the band mm -hmm. and the lyrics are great. I, I will say that the first side is absolute perfection. And then you flip it, you know, it's three songs. They're all like long, meaty songs. You flip it, the energy does go down a little after once in a lifetime. But if you're in the right mood for it, you just follow it along. And then at the end, you know, it gets very, very spaced out. A little bit like Fear of Music and with Drugs. You know, it's a sort of similar kind of, we're just going to chill you right out and take you to kind of a different place than the polyrhythms and the busyness of the other songs. But I just absolutely love it. Remain in Light. Uh, this is my uh, promo copy that I got from a music critic that I somehow befriended. And he was selling off all his records, went to his apartment. And so I don't get the really cool album cover, but I do get there's liner notes and things that they sent to critics that that informed my relationship to the album because I understood that there was some thought that went behind it. They were reading books about African music and the place of music in West Africa or in South Africa, not just taking the sounds, but trying to understand the impulse that went to making those sounds. So I, I think it's a really, really great album. I love speaking in tongues too, but this one had unfair, to be unfair yeah, music. my number two album of the 80s, Rain and Light. Great choice. And again, it's uh, go and watch our Talking Head show. You know, none of us say anything. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's another one from 1980. Yep, 1980 was a killer year. It's an old, old killer. killer. <laughs> my my number my number two. Uh, I could have chosen three albums again by this artist. Rod's already chosen one, and I've gone with Peter Gabriel Three Melt. <laughs> it's just it's fab it's fabulous. It's a, it again. It's a masterpiece. It really is. Um, I love the fact that Peter Gabriel had two drummers on it. He's got. Uh, Jerry Maratto and Phil Collins. I'm a huge Phil Collins drum fan. I think he's a great drummer. And uh, the, the, the one thing, thing they were told, no cymbals on the album, which is a mm. remarkable thing to do. Phil yeah. Collins just said, yeah, no problem. Apparently Jerry Maratto took a bit of persuasion. But um, it's, it's noticeable. It's not. And of course, the production, Steve Lillywhite, uses that gated drum sound that he's got on it with a reverb of gates, so, which was, you know... Mm -hmm. You know, it was used throughout the 80s, wasn't it? You know, but this is one of those earlier albums that did it. I think Susie did it just before then, but then he sort of did it with Peter Gabriel and then Genesis took it. And so it's, it's just a great album. It's dark. It is dark. There's a lot of dark themes on the album. I mean, you've got The Intruder, which is one of the weirdest opening songs ever. Could easily be a Genesis song from mm -hmm. the Lam era, without a shadow of a doubt, telling a story. It's Again, it's just fabulous. This big heavy drum sound that sounds like Mama, that Genesis clearly borrowed from, I think, or in the air tonight. It's got that sort of drum sound feel to it. And then it's got some real sort of highlights on, on the album. The musicianship is amazing. I mean, Robert Fripp just jumps out on this album. He's great. It's got Dave Gregory from XTC on it. It's got Paul Weller on a track. Mm -hmm. Kate Bush appears twice. And uh, you know, also we've got the Kate Bush relationship. And I will say, Kate Bush and Peter Gabriel are almost sort of mirror images of each other in terms of the, the musical styles, what they do. They go so well. They, 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 they really are both from the same sort of same sort of music musicality area, both both equally brilliant. But the album's just just great. I love the sort of power of the album as well. No self-control is just fantastic. Uh, you know, you've got um well, so we've got family snapshots, great. I mean, 
I love Games Without Frontiers. It's Games Without Frontiers. Just, just one of the Excellent. great songs. I loved it as yeah. well because at the time we had a little dog called Sasha. So I used to love it when the line Sasha uh, <laughs> in the song. It was always thrilled me. You know, God bless. It's a big, yeah. big chart hit. Imagine, imagine a song was, like yeah, as left field as that, and, and that that sort of yeah. That sound getting yeah, really on all, which was <laughs> remarkable. I think yeah. it was just about his biggest hit. Oh, no, amazing, amazing, really. Um, again, you've uh, uh, just a great song, isn't it? And again, about the folly of uh, of war and the international appeals, and he just sees it as people see it as a, as a game, and he, he's, he's seeing how ridiculous the situation is. And again, sadly, it mirrors of what's going on now, of course. Yeah. We then got uh, not one of us. Which is clearly links to the eye. Some people say, I've re read online, people say, no, oh, it's not about race because he says we're all the same. This and the other. But it can be. You know, you can physically look the same but be different, you know. And so it could be race, it could be sort of an ethnic group, you know, whatever it might be. But it's definitely mm -hmm. the sense of the other. And in it, and he, again, he's mocking those fools who sort of sort of like to divide. I thought it was, his lyrics are brilliant. It's really, really powerful, really punky, actually. It's really got that new wave vibe to it. Um, leading all my life, lovely. I'm going to be controversial here. Biko is absolutely brilliant, but would have been much better on security, in my personal opinion, because it fits in sound wise with security, the <laughs> Gabriel 4. Yeah, it does and, kind of stand out. Oh, and I bit. would have had We Do What We're Told, which was on So, but he'd written for this album. And I think that would have been a great way to finish the album off in a real dark sort of mm -hmm. 1984 sort of way, if you like, you know, this because it's got that, that sort of feel. Do you think he put Beaker on the end maybe to, you know, because it's quite a dark album? Yeah. Uh, no. Do you think he put Beaker on the end as a, as a sort of, as a beacon of hope, kind of like to make it uplifting at the end? It's hard to tell because it is and it isn't, isn't it? And I think it's just because he wrote it and he wanted it just to get that out there. I think he realised it was such an important song. But for me, it just would fit in much better on security. I think it just goes with that sound. Um, but, but, you know, that's, hey, that's absolutely nitpicking if, if one of the greatest albums ever written, in my opinion. <laughs> um, it, it certainly fits in my top 10 albums ever. It really does. I think it's that great an album. Um, so, yeah. Great cover, too. <laughs> great cover. Absolutely love the cover. Very clever. Um, so, yeah, I've gone with Peter Gabriel 3 or Melt, as it's known as. So, Rod, what's your number one? Uh, yeah, my, my number one's the, the only artist that's got two in my ten, which is uh, Disintegration by The Cure. Right. Um, it's it's seen as their sort of, I don't know, their, their masterpiece album, although they have got a lot of great albums. They've done I have a got a few of them, actually, haven't they? They've done a lot of great music over time, but that but that album is The Cure in a nutshell, really, because it's, it's, it's poppy like Head on a Door can be in the sense that your love song, yeah, just a great crafted melodic pop song that was covered by Adele as a ballad and was a hit <laughs> again. Um, and then you got Lullaby, which is quite kind of slow and very curie. But then he's, they've got big, long, expansive ones. Like Pictures of You is one of my favourite songs of all yeah, time. Brilliant, brilliant. There's a few remixes of it as well, but just it's so simple, but it isn't. Because if it was that simple, people would make pictures of views every five minutes, wouldn't they? But they, but they don't. And and it, it's little little riffages and little layers of songs and keyboards, and, and it's more to do with the fact that his. It's a bit like Tom York and Radiohead again and whatnot. His voice goes so well with the music. It's it just does it just fits the music, and some people are really good at making delivering lines in exactly the right way for that song. At exactly that time, and Robert Smith's an absolute master at that. I think it's achingly fantastic pictures of you, and then you've got your know, disintegration, the title track, um, even untitled, um, plain songs, a great song, much more sort of expansive and sort of cinematic sounding. But you, you, they can do sort of six or seven minute soundscapes and three minute pop songs as good as anybody, you know. And you know, the, the guy's a genius, and you know, that that's my favourite Cure album. I probably play it the most. I play those songs the most, certainly. Um, and can't wait for the new album. It features. On, I think I picked it on my double albums thingy because yeah, I think you did over sixty minutes, doesn't it? With the extra tracks on it, it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, but it's, it's a it's a great. It's, I think it's a fantastic album. Yeah, it's absolutely. Really, absolutely. Really polished, yeah. top tier, top tier songwriting. Yeah. And again, I mentioned it earlier with the head on the door, but also 
Joy Division in a way. You know, I am a bit, I like melancholic music, but they're, it's uplifting, joyous. Mm. <laughs> it's, a, it's a joyous darkness about it. You know, pornography and, and faith and stuff are as well, but this, this is the perfect blend of, of everything they do on one album, yeah. I think. Yeah, it's a great, great, great album. Great one to finish off with, Rod. Well done, super choice. Eighty nine, I think. So right, eighty nine, right at the end. Yeah, my number two was my number two was nineteen eighty, and my number yeah. one was nineteen eighty nine. Yeah, so it must be either end. But, great, yeah. great choice, Jeremy. What's your number one? My number one is also from nineteen eighty, and it's another one in our Sergeant Pepper. Yeah, sweepstakes with Bowie and Tony Visconti, really trying to do that approach where every song is given a different feel and flavor and color, scary monsters and super creeps. The last RCA album by Bowie capstoning one of the greatest runs, I think from hunky dory to scary monsters, There's very few longers in that run, which is really amazing when you think about it. So many good albums. And I remember when this came out, there were some people who were, disappointed in it they thought he was co-opting something in a way and that was part of his thing he would take bits and pieces we know that but he made them his own and he also had a way of legitimizing those ideas so then they became part of the lingua franca of pop music when you think about the drumming on a song like scary monsters sure you can see that he was listening to joy division and that very particular way that stephen morris had of Instead of doing a, a paradiddle fill, he would do a da, 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 you know one stick or rat you know rat tat 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 to drive the song forward. It's a very different approach to rhythm, kind of on top of the beat rather than behind the beat. And Bowie just like took that, and the fact that he had possibly one of the, definitely one of the top ten greatest rhythm sections of all time. Oh, uh, what a band! Worked with him since Station to Station, Dennis Davis and George Murray. Yeah. This is the last time he worked with them. Carlos Alamo. And those guys could do anything. They were just absolutely incredible. When you think about a song like Fashion, the drumming on that is so perfect. It's it's witty, too. When you listen to the way Dennis Davis plays the hi-hat on, on the song, it's got a great sense of humor to it. And the song itself, as we know, is kind of a riff on is fashion fascist? Is it fascist? You know, are you a, if you're following fashion, are you actually just falling in line like a soldier, you know, mm. turn to the left, right? You know, it's just, and and Dennis Davis just picks up on all of the subplots in the song and just puts them all in that insouciant little hi-hat thing. It kind of drives you crazy when you listen to it. And then obviously this, the opener, It's No Game with the Japanese vocals, it's just so extreme and Bowie just shredding his voice. It's so satisfying in a way. It's cathartic. And at the end, obviously, when he tells Robert Fripp to shut up, you know, yeah. it's, it's it's just so satisfying. I, I absolutely love the sound. Ashes to Ashes, just a perfect new wave pop song. And when you think about what happened next in music throughout the 80s, sometimes I, I like to say this album invented the 80s. He really put so many things in place that other people could pick up on and, and make their own and make into chart-topping hits. This was a pretty successful album for him. Obviously, not as successful as Let's Dance, which came out three years later. But he did want to be successful with his record, and I think he was. But most of all, it just felt like all the threads from those RCA albums, everything he'd been working on over the years, through the glam era, the Berlin era, just everything just poured into this album and this came out as a kaleidoscope of everything that Bowie and Visconti could do when they were working together. It's just an absolutely extraordinary record. We haven't done our Bowie show yet. On some days, this is my number one Bowie album. Not every day, but on some days it is. And it's definitely one of my top 10 albums of the 80s. Yeah, my number one. We have a winner, folks, because my number one scary monsters and super All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was never in doubt because it's possibly my favorite ever album. But again, it could be low, so or it could be Lodger. But um, <laughs> it's it's right up there. 
or, or others. Um, I, you've said most of the things that I would say. I think the, the lineup of the band, Dennis Davis, Carlos Alomar, George Murray, just amazing. Alomar, yeah. Uh, Fripp incredible. is just incredible on it. I mean, the guitar solo on fashion is <laughs> nuts. That would never <laughs> be in the charts by today's standards. That would not get past the test of is that <laughs> listenable. Because it's an incredible solo. I love it, but it's nuts. It's so out there. And I think Fripp did it in one or two takes. He just literally went and plugged it and just played it. The master. You know, just Bowie just said, "Oh, do you think that was it?" You know, um, it, it's the, it's it's just a, a remarkable album. There's so many great. Every song on it is brilliant. I love the girl at the beginning, Mishi Harata, and she's mm -hmm. she's on the Sparks Kimono My House album. She's one of the models on the front of it. Oh, she's that things that? on it. And I got, her, I got I picked up a copy of that at a record fair recently. That album, terrific album, actually. <laughs> And her, her vocals uh, against Bowie's jaw, but they work really well. It's just great. Uh, so just uh, up the hill backwards could have been on Diamond Dogs. I think it's one of those <clears throat> tracks. Scary Monsters is brilliant. Very mm -hmm. cool, very dark, quite creepy. Ashes to Ashes. Um, he, he nicked the drum beat from My Girl by Madness. <laughs> he loved the song My Girl, and he said, "Oh, what that drum beat!" And so he they, they took it and he wrote Ashes to Ashes. And Ashes to Ashes, <laughs> the song itself got the number one for me. Possibly t poss knocked off, possibly the greatest ever song ever, which was The Winner Takes It All by ABBA uh, <laughs> in the UK. I, I, I genuinely believe that. Uh, it was just a remarkable song. Uh, Fashion, brilliant, which was originally called Jamaica. Mm -hmm. um, Teenage Wildlife is possibly the best sung song album on it. His voice is just amazing. Uh, it clearly influences yeah. the guy out of the Associates, who I think just takes all of that song and used his career on it when he was alive, bless him. Um, Scream Like a Baby, brilliant. Kingdom, which was an, another previous song that he rewrote. Uh, Kingdom Come. F apparently Tom Villain was supposed to play a guitar on it because it was his song, and he fannied around for so long in the studio <laughs> that they got fed up with him, and then they just got Robert Fripp to, re Fripp to record it all. <laughs> and then uh, Because You're Young, I, I, well, it's, it's perfect for me. It's got my favourite two songwriters on. It's got Pete Townsend. It's got David Bowie on it. What, what more can yeah. I ask for? Uh, so it's brilliant. Uh, and then It's No Game Part 2. Fantastic ending. It just bookends it. It's know, a just, circular structure. Because I think if you to go down. over to Crystal Japan, but I don't think that would have worked. I don't think that yeah. would have worked. Although you could have argued if he'd put the, the, the space oddity on at the end, which he did for the Kenny Everett show, that <laughs> very Spartan sound version, that might have worked in an mm. unusual way, but that would have worked. But yeah, oh, it's it's just a remarkable album. Visconti's production superb. It's such a shame he didn't go and work with them straight after Let's Dance because that's who he should have went back to. Yeah, it took a while for them to get there. Yeah, to, because uh, after that, he did some absolute turkeys. And really? uh, he admit, admitted it himself, you know. Uh, yeah. Tin Machine, I love the first Tin Machine album. But uh, Machine, right. yeah, it's just some, yeah. But what a great, great album. And for me, his run went from Space Oddity up to Scary Monsters with one bad album, probably, and that's Pin Ups, but it's just a cover album. Uh, <laughs> and it's 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 the most remarkable like run in music for me. I don't think anybody's got to run that long. It's just incredible. No, it's oh, it's it's killer absolutely after killer song. after killer. Um, absolutely. Just, yeah, yeah, without 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 that consistency, it's probably unmatched, isn't it? I yeah, would say. I, I, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. He over is, a period of time, I think. Yeah, he defines the whole of the seventies, but of course, he starts off what these are the eighties. Um, That's right. So, yeah, yeah. it was a spark for so genius. many things that came that were to come, and you know. What is the one thing that the music business that destroys artists is is the business part of things. Yeah. And when you read about what RCA and Main Man did to him, behind the scenes, they turned him into an employee yeah. of his own company. So he comes out at you know the contract's ready for renewal he and realizes he has no money. Yeah. After all the things he had done, all the records he had sold, the world tours the you know world changing music he was yeah skint and that's but why you, that was but, wish you were here. but wish you were here in real life yeah but that's why he went right and that's why he went into making less dance and saying i'm gonna storm the charts i'm gonna i'm this is my payoff i'm gonna get a new label work with new people and make some serious money and he did, but then, of course, he was trapped. <laughs> yeah.
Right, yeah. so there we go. A clear number one. Right, some very quick honourable mentions because we've overrun. So if we just yes. give, give it a minute each, pick four or five albums that you think that you should get a quick mention. Literally a minute. What do you think, Rod? Um, I'd mentioned earlier Ocean, Rain, Remain in Light. These are ones that didn't quite make it for me. Melt, which obviously was pretty high for you. Um, I've written down Thriller from Michael Jackson because it's hard to ignore that brilliant. album. Yeah, it is brilliant. Um, Bruce Springsteen had... Two or three albums in the 80s, River. Um, you mentioned Tunnel of Love, which yeah. is a lesser one, but still born in the USA. Um, and then Security um, as well, I would say. Talk, talk, possibly. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, well, I'll, I'll Spirit of Eden and Laughing Stock, yeah. um, particularly. Um, so there's a couple of that I would say that I could have, that could have been in the argument, maybe. Um, I think yeah. that's probably about it yeah. for me. Jeremy, yourself? For me, a few that really hurt me to leave off the list were Simple Minds, New Gold Dream, yeah. Metallica, Master of Puppets, yeah, Ornate, know, yeah. Island, go. In All Languages, Obscure, I know, Virgin Prunes, If I Die, I Die, Brian Eno, Apollo, Scott Walker, Climate of Hunter, LL Cool J, Radio, or the next one is good too, uh, um, Bigger and Deffer, Eric B and Rakim, Paid in Full, Brad Brain's first album, Birthday Party, Prayers on Fire, Black Uhuru, Sinsamilla, Julie Cruz, Floating into the Night, 1989. Dylan put out Infidels and Oh Mercy, both great oh, albums. Oh Mercy, yeah. Oh, well, oh, yeah. oh Mercy. Brian Ferry, Boys and Girls. That's one that was on my list, yeah. Incredible. Gavin Friday, After the Virgin Prunes, Each Man Kills the Thing He Loves. Such a fantastic record. Gregory Isaacs, Night Nurse, one of the best reggae albums of all time. And finally, Linton Quasey Johnson, <clears throat> Bass Culture or Making History. They're both incredible. Yep. He was sort of in the Gil Scott Heron vein, if you will. Yeah, he's Spoken great. word over just the, yeah. some of the best reggae grooves of all time. The Pixies. I mean, those are just a few, like I said, I've had Pixies, five yeah. albums on my list. So. Oh, do, do little and Serparosa. Yeah. Oh my God! Stop. Yeah, Pixies. I, I, I just I don't know why I forgot about it. We're putting the Pixies into the nineties. Could have could have <laughs> four off the Pixies for me. Like when we do uh, the nineties, we'll, we'll I, I could have had the undertones, positive touch. Yeah. Could have yeah. had the jam, um, sound effects, the Beats first album, uh, the Eurythmics, Be Yourself Tonight, which I love, just great pop album. Yeah. Uh, Robert Cray, Bad Influence. Or the Stevie Ray's second album as well, Stevie Ray Vaughan, because I think the blues was the other big genre that really kicked on again in the in the eighties, along with obviously mm. metal, um, madness. I could have picked two or three madness albums. I think you've mentioned everything else there that I think Richard Thompson, Richard and Linda Thompson's last album, mm. and Pete Townsend's two solo album, two two albums, Empty Jay Glass is a and Empty record. Glass. I think either one? one of those. Yeah. So there. Sorry, which one? Uh, all cowboys have Chinese eyes or empty yeah. glass. Empty glass was the first one. Yeah. So oh, she's in the band. Like face dances too. Face and the banshees, of course. But I had the banshees, banshees on the last the one. Yeah, all was, the post punk Didn't stuff put them in. So yeah. Juju would be the other one as well, of course. Juju, yeah. 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 King Sunny a Day, Fela. Yeah. I mean, or there's King, so or Kings of the Wild Frontiers the, as well. The Feelings. The Feelings. Yes. So there we go, folks. Oh. We, we could talk forever. We've talked a long time. So yes. <laughs> send in your list. Your favorite albums. All right. Sorry about the length. But <laughs> okay. Feel the quality, I think, is the phrase. So yes. uh, until the next time, from Rod, Jeremy, and myself, thank you very much. Subscribe to the channel. Go and check out our other shows on Madness, XTC, Post Punk. Talking Heads, all of these great artists, Genesis and what have you, come up and subscribe to the channel. And until the next time, take care and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.